I like to talk. Listening to Black Fawn Distros Take Over Tuesday, the official podcast of Black Fawn Distribution, broadcasting live across the planet and retransmitted on all major streaming platforms. Tonight's program is brought to you in part by Wellington Breweries, Hellas Lager, Deadly Grounds Coffee, Twisted Teas, and of course Canada's number one genre film company, Black Fawn Distribution. You wanted the best, well. They didn't make it, so here's what you get. It's really not that bad. You are going to get it on. Here's your host, Benner from Black Fawn Distro. All right, everyone. How's everyone doing out there? Uh, my name is Benner from Black Font Distro, and uh, we are back with another episode of Takeover Tuesday. Uh, there I am on the screen. Um, welcome back. It's 2022. A uh, happy new year to everyone. I uh, hope everyone had a great holiday, and um, hopefully you can hear me out there in the internet world. We've got uh, a great program here for you tonight. Um, we are broadcasting live of course to facebook twitch twitter and youtube uh and then retransmitting on all the major streaming platforms of course including apple podcast and spotify um make sure you like follow and share and subscribe um wherever you can whatever platform you're listening on um we'd appreciate the support and of course it helps us out we're not going to lie uh, but it also helps out our guests as well in the projects and the super cool projects that they're working on um so quick shout out to our sponsors of course wellington breweries hellas lager uh deadly grounds coffee and twisted teas uh thank you so much for your support uh, last year and all of 2021 and we uh we do appreciate the continued support in 2022 as well so we've got a great program for you tonight uh first show 2022 as i mentioned and we figured we'd do a little bit of a two for one uh tonight so we've got um directors gabriel career and reese evanesian in the house virtually of course uh, but they're here to talk about their new home invasion flick for the sake of vicious um the film is currently available on bod and blu-ray but it also has its streaming premiere this week on the almighty shutter. Uh, so January 6th, uh, set your calendars, set your clock, set your timers, set your alarms. Uh, shutter, uh, is, um, shutter exclusive, uh, for the sake of vicious dropping on January 6th, which is Thursday. Um, we've got both dudes currently in the green room, uh, giving me the thumbs up. So, uh, we're happy to have them and, uh, we're going to jump into a whole bunch of stuff tonight. Um, uh, but before we get there, um, there's a few things that, uh, we just want to talk about and, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on, obviously, in the world right now. Uh, we are in, we are still in the pandemic, of course, but uh, we didn't really want to talk too much about that because we thought we'd get rid of it in 2021. Um, but uh, we're still kind of in it right now. So unfortunately, um, we're still dealing with that. However, um, we have some cool stuff to talk about. And before we get there, uh, you know, before we talk to our guests tonight, Gabe and Reese in the house, uh, let's hit the news. Okay, and we're back with another edition of the news. Um, it, like I said, it is a happy new year. Happy 2022 to everyone. Uh, I am wearing my uh, purple tie today to do this news update because I figured, hey, it was fitting. And plus, uh, going well with the blazer. If you are tuning in on YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and Twitter, and you can see me. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, if you can't, and if you're tuning in on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, well, that's just one more incentive for you to tune in uh, live uh, each week to see uh, my news get up. So, uh, but let's jump in. Um, don't 
don't want to take up too much time because we've got a, like I said, we've got a full uh, pack show tonight. Uh, but our top story tonight is, uh, yeah, listen, we're still in a pandemic sucks. Um, so, uh, we almost made it out of 2021, but, uh, guess what? Omicron, Omicron, whatever that bad guy from the transformers movie showed up and, uh, we didn't plan on this either, but, uh, everyone in Ontario right now is kind of stuck at home. Um, a little bit, uh, we've got kind of a lockdown. So this is just our announcement to say we did not plan to have the directors of a home invasion film on our first show and, and, and anticipate us being in a sort of a lockdown. So just so you guys know, it wasn't planned, um, but we're really excited to have everyone uh, on the show. Of course, Gabriel Crer, uh, Reese Evanation coming up uh, just after the break here. Um, now we've got a, a, quite a few things to talk about on the news today. Uh, first and foremost, um, after, or I shouldn't say, I guess, second and second most, um, we've got uh, Infamous Horror, uh, which is a uh, really awesome horror community operating out of Montreal. Um, and well, we partnered up with them to actually launch a uh, contest, uh, which is running the whole month of January. And uh, I'll just throw it up on the screen. Uh, we're kind of sponsoring it with them and offering a really, really wicked uh, Black Von Distro uh, prize pack. Um, so uh, make sure you check them out. It's really, really easy to enter. If we throw it up on the screen here, uh, basically uh, all you have to do is like and comment on their post on their Facebook. So if you just go to Facebook, find inf infamous, infamous horror, sorry. And uh, you just read their post and it's got the instructions there as well. Subscribe to infamous horror on YouTube as well as black Von distro on YouTube, and then share the post that they have on Facebook. And you'll be entered to win this grand prize prize pack from black Von distro, which includes a whole whack of Blu-rays and DVDs as long as well as a uh, black Von distro toque trucker hat woven patch and a bag of our awesome coffee, uh, which we partnered up with deadly grounds for uh, last year. And of course, our hats and all of our merchandise is made by Twisted Tees also. So uh, check out their website, uh, check out their Facebook, go find that post, uh, enter to win, and uh, they will be announcing the uh, winners, I think, at the end of, uh, well, I guess the contest ends at the end of January. So they'll be uh, answering the, uh, or sorry, announcing the winners uh, in February, early February is my best guess. So uh, moving right along, uh, we've got uh, a quick announcement to say, uh, uh, Myself, I'm, I'm going to be on the next episode of the movie Madhouse, which is a podcast run ran by uh, or run by our good friend Robert Bellamy, and uh, basically uh, he he always calls me up sometimes and asks me if I want to come on and, and voice my opinions about other films that are maybe not horror related. Um, so uh, he asked me to come on. I'll be on the next episode, which is January 10th, Monday. So next Monday, movie Madhouse. Look him up. Uh, you can catch the podcast as well on on all the major platforms, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, what we thought of Spider Man No Way Home and uh, Matrix uh, Resurrections. Um, so two fairly. Uh, different sequels I'll, I'll just leave it at that but make sure you tune in if you want my thoughts and opinions on stuff that's not horror uh and looking forward to hear my voice even more than you already have tonight uh you can tune in to rob's podcast movie madhouse uh next monday on january 6th uh now uh we also always do a physical media review and uh this week i thought hey you know what what better movie to review than for the sake of vicious um, this is a, the Blu-ray release, uh, put out in Canada by, uh, Raven Banner. And of course, uh, good friends with the Raven Banner guys, um, and Sean, and the whole team over there. I know they put a lot of work into this, uh, physical release. And of course it's got a sweet, sweet slip case, uh, as you can see, uh, different artwork underneath. And, uh, we'll get to, uh, uh, Gabe and Reese will be able to tell us a little bit about this artwork on here. Super, super, super cool. Um, I can't remember exactly where you can get it. I know Sunrise has copies of these, so you can probably order it online and uh, as well as through Raven Banner, I believe as well. But we'll get the details uh, from the directors of the project uh, uh, after the break. And uh, before we get going, uh, of course, we have to do our annual or sorry, our weekly or biweekly or whatever you want to call it, our chicken sandwich report. Here is me eating a giant chicken sandwich, as you can see in the top left-hand corner. Uh, this was a recommendation from uh, our last guest, Chad Archibald, who is my boss too, right? So anyway, he told me Tall Tree Sandwich Company out of Hamilton. You got to go check them out. They got a sandwich that's crazy. Um, our chicken fried chicken sandwich report, of course, is a report where I go out and try a chicken sandwich and tell you how good it is. Um, and why do we do that? Well, because fried chicken is just so damn tasty. And if you get that reference, let me know in the comments below. Um, so anyway, we tracked out to Hamilton. We had one of these sandwiches. Uh, as you can see, look at the size of that thing. It's amazing. Um, it's chicken everywhere. You couldn't even keep the chicken in the sandwich. It was like, and also I got to have a shout out here. Tons of pickles tons and tons and tons of pickles in the sandwich, uh, lots of sauce. It was really, really good, crisp breading, um, but nothing too greasy. So it was light. Uh, and also like a, a, just a lot of sandwich. 
Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb here and I say, look, it's four and a half out of five. Uh, I couldn't quite get to the five out of five, but it's tied for first place. And of course, let's look at the standings right now. Um, fried chicken sandwiches, the fried chicken sandwich report from Black Von Distro. We still have Coco Chicken in the lead, but also tied for first Tall Tree Sandwich Company going in there at number two. Uh, but both sandwiches are rated a four and a half out of five. And of course, Zinger Chick with the bronze medal currently with four to five and everything else below. And of course, we only do a top 10, which means that Subway's chicken sandwich did not make the cut this this week. Um, so wasn't too impressed with that one. And uh, it's uh, it's been deleted. So uh I apologize for that. Um, sorry, Subway. Um, we'll try and uh, we'll maybe try and give you a second chance down the road. But uh, look, if you're in Hamilton, Tall Tree Sandwich Co., check them out. If you're in Guelph, check out Coco Chicken and Zinger Chick, both local family-run businesses uh, that could use your support, especially now uh, since a lot of things are kind of closed down. Um, give them a call, look them up. And if you like fried chicken sandwiches as much as I do, you'll probably dig them as well. Now, uh, moving on to our guest tonight. Uh, Look, let's talk about For the Sake of Vicious. Um, this is a really, really, really wicked, awesome movie. Um, Gabriel Carrere, Reese Evanesian, they're the co-directors of the film. And uh, it premiered at Fantasia International Film Festival and it went on to screen at other such prestigious festivals such as Sitches in Spain and Fright Fest in the UK. Um, it's been busting up audiences around the world. And guess what? Business is about to pick up because it's actually debuting on Shudder, as I mentioned before, this Thursday, January 6th. Now, um, Carrere has directed uh, such Canadian genre hits as The Demolisher in The House of Flies and If a Tree Falls, while Reese has also directed the dystopian sci-fi flick Defective, as well as Dead Genesis. Um, so they recently teamed up to direct For the Sake of Vicious together, which we're going to get into in just a moment. Um, but it, this movie, let me tell you, it's a bloody, unrelenting action flick um, starring Laura Burke, Nick Smith, and Colin Paradine. Uh, it's got tons of action, blood, violence, adrenaline, motorcycles, you name it. It's got everything. It's currently sitting at an impressive 83% on Rotten Tomatoes. This flick is insane insanely an insane wild ride and it's definitely one i recommend that you take as soon as you can so let's take a quick peek at the trailer just so you know what we're going to be talking about in uh in in the next uh within the next hour and over the next hour sorry and uh look we've got gabe and reese on the other side uh and we're going to get to them right after this you raped my daughter <laughs> You beat a guy half to death, broke into my house, made me lie to my kid. Please, no, I'm not here to hurt you. It's in Charlotte, right? You're the dad. There's someone on the way. They're not going to let us leave. I don't know what to do right now, but something is happening that is completely out of our control. All right. And we're back. And hey, that was for the sake of Vicious. And welcome to the program, uh, directors, co-directors of this awesome, awesome movie, uh, Gabriel Carrere and Reese Evanesian. Uh, guys, welcome to the program. Thanks for thanks for making the time, man. Uh, and thanks for swinging in. How are you guys doing? Good, man. Thanks for having us. No problem. Yeah, man. Thanks. So uh, happy new year. I uh, hope you guys had a, uh, an awesome sort of uh, holiday as much as you could. Um, and of course uh, had lots of holiday eats and lots of candy and all the stuff you're not supposed to have. And uh, do you have any new, year, new year's resolutions that you're, that you're currently working on right now? Oh boy. <laughs> Dave, you go first. <laughs> 
Well, it's funny. You're like talking about crispy chicken sandwiches. And <laughs> I've stopped eating that stuff and I'm eating salads. And I just literally had a salad 25 minutes before you sent that. And there's one thing on the list that I haven't seen was Mary Brown's. And my girlfriend swears by their new crispy sandwiches. Okay. It's, it's on the list, man. Uh, you're the second person to recommend that. So I've got a uh, uh, shout out to Jason Rockman as well. Uh, he recommended that I go try out the, uh, it's like the vegan uh, or the vegetarian uh, non-chicken chicken sandwich at Pizza Pizza. He told me to check that one out. Uh, so I, I got that on my list and I got Mary Brown's as well. And uh, so, so I'll, I'll make sure I get those in over the next couple of weeks. So I'll, I'll put that down as your recommendation as well. And, I'll, and you got to watch a future episode, see if I review it. <laughs> Lots of salads. <laughs> uh, so uh, there won't be any salad report. I'll tell you that much. That's, that's my, uh, <laughs> that's my uh, new year's resolution uh, just so everyone knows, but uh, listen, uh, thanks for joining the program. I know you guys got a lot of going on this week. Uh, we're doing kind of the, the, sort of this is the, the second leg of the press tour for this film um, came out or sorry, uh, filmed in uh, I think 2020 or 2019. Uh, around 2019. Yep. 2019. Yep. Uh, it dropped at Fantasia 2020. And then of course it got released last year, but now it's being picked up and, and it's going fully. Is it on shutter? Is it all, all the shutter territories or is it just Canada and the U S right now? Do you guys know? Uh, it's just the U S UK, Italy, Australia, and New Zealand for now. And okay. it'll be Canada hopefully later this year i know it is coming to shutter canada we just don't know exactly when because okay, cool. nobody else has the streaming rates in canada right now so right right and of course hey if you haven't you haven't haven't been able to check it out uh as you can see just behind me right where we're where are we i always get this screwed up right here uh for the sake of vicious the the blu-ray uh, is available um do you guys know uh i mentioned i know it's available in sunrise do you know where else it's available where people might be able to pick it up right now Cinema. Well, there's an independent retailer. Um, I think it's only, is it only in Ontario? Cinema yeah. One? Cinema one. Yeah. Yeah. You can order it from cinema one. Some of them have it on the shelves. Uh, that fancy copy of it. I I'm pretty sure right now, Raven Manor is probably your best bet. Their website, their store has it. Right. I know they had some really good deals going on. I'm not sure if that's still going on. Um, but you can also pick up just the regular Blu-ray, which has all the same special features through Amazon and all that. So, Okay, cool. Well, like I said, it's, it, this is, it, it's, it's totally a, a movie worth tracking down, checking out. Um, I've known you guys for, for a while. You guys have worked together uh, off and on like for, for over a decade now, and we're going to get to that in a little bit for sure. Um, just throwing it out to the audience. If you're tuning in right now, if you're live, uh, if you're tuning in on Facebook or Twitch, Twitter, uh, or uh, YouTube, uh, make sure you throw down your comments uh, in the comment section. We're going to get to them throughout the broadcast um, and we can post them online uh, uh, or uh, during the broadcast uh, live. So uh, if you've got a question for Gabe or Reese uh, about uh, for the sake of vicious or any of the other projects that they've worked on in the past, feel free to drop them in the comments and we will try and get to them as we can. So, um, now before we get to anything else, um, let's talk about this, this film, because, uh, you guys, this is the first film you've co-directed together. Yeah. Um, and how did that come to be? Because you've worked on various projects for each other over the years and, and what kind of brought this project up to, up to the forefront and said, you know what, we're going to, because, because Gabe, you came up with the story for this and then Reese, you wrote the script, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so you both were there from day one. And is that kind of a reason where you decided to kind of both jump behind the camera and, and go for a ride on this one? Yeah. Like the story was very different than what it's turned out to be. You know, like originally it took place in the summer. It was a SWAT team invading the house during a blackout completely different um and then you know just during one of our lunches at the mall um we just started talking we were both coming off i think we we're you were coming off defective was it you no. you, you were off defective i was off yeah. demolisher and it was just like two roads just meet and we were um feeling the same kind of energy you know kind of not angry, maybe a little bit of anger from our last films and a little mixed emotions. So we kind of just melted together. And then and he took this one page outline I had, not even, and uh, pumped out a script in like two weeks. And then it was, what was it, like almost a year back and forth with you and Raven Bear? Yeah. Well, I mean, there was just something about the story when he pitched it to me at the mall. And I mean, Phil's like the master at pitching a million stories a minute. Um, and he just, there was something about this specific story. And again, it's funny because it's, they're barely identical. Like if I still have that one pager that he sent me 
And other than maybe the first paragraph, it that, that's about the only thing that stayed in the movie. But there was just something about it when he first told me about it that I went, uh, yeah, I think this would be a lot of fun to write. And it just caught me at the right moment. And I know that um, we had, as you pointed out in your intro, like we've, we've always helped each other out on our movies since 2008 now, I think. And it was just one of those moments where I went, I think it'd be a lot of fun to, to write something for you. Directing came later down the line. In fact, that came maybe be like probably less than five or six months before we shot. Originally I was just going to write it for Gabe and he was going to go make it and I was going to produce it for him. And then, um, brainwashed me <laughs> suckered me into it <laughs> so, so 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 you mentioned 2008 because i actually you know it's, it's funny because part of this program too is is uh, i love finding out things that i are I, I mean i'm not necessarily um totally sure on and and reese you just mentioned you guys started working in 2008 do you remember when you guys started working together and what project was on and like and how does that collaboration just for our listeners and our viewers, like how did that, how did that collaboration kind of evolve from when you first started to boom, you're now on black Von distros takeover Tuesday with me. I remember, <laughs> I remember meeting Gabe for the first time in 2007. Was this from, and, from your night of living dead thing? Oh God. Yeah. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it was for. <laughs> There was a event that was being put on by Ed Video, which is in Guelph. Is was like it still is. It's you know how would you describe it? An art collective, I guess. Yeah, a media center. Where if you, you don't, yeah, it's government funded, and if you want to make a short film, or learn how to dabble into you know filmmaking or any kind of narrative or documentary or media art, um, it's the the place to go to to kind of launch that. But back in like two thousand and six, two thousand and seven. That was the hub for filmmakers in Guelph. That was Chad Archibald, Gabe Carrer, and I was, I mean, and there's a bit of an age difference between all of us, but I was the youngest out of the three of us. And that's when I met all of them was through Ed Video. And I met, uh, I met Gabe at one of those events that night. And I remember my first interaction is somebody pointed and said, oh, that's Gabe Carrer over there. And I literally waved to you from across the room. That was our first meeting. And then the first thing I worked on you with is when you did, I think it had to have been If a Tree Falls when you guys did that in the summer. I think it was before that. I honestly think there was some short films happening. I think there was a guy that came to Guelph to make some zombie film and like Ryan was in it. Tom Gofton was in it. There was a whole bunch of Erica Cox was in it. Yeah. And I think, I think you were involved with that. I think like there was a bunch of weird little, short things that we weren't directing, but we'd go help out. On right. That. Right. Well, the, the most significant thing I remember is if a tree falls, Yeah, because I still have that email that he sent me really? back in 2008. Jesus. Saying, hey, we don't really know each other that well, but you know, I've seen some of the stuff you do and I know, you know, we're working with Chad and all these guys. And um, I really think it would be fun if we all, uh, if we all worked on this together and that's sort of what, what, what cinched it. And somewhere in there, Benner, is when I met you as well back then. I was going to say, if you still have that email, please tell me that's the one. That, that's that's what's in the frame behind you in your office there. That it's framed on the wall. The <laughs> yeah, I've got that email for you. I got to know who your service provider is, man. I got to get that email service. That's amazing. No. Um, well, okay, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's it's. Like I like I said, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how to put a, a particular date on on certain things, especially in, in the Guelph film community and and now even Southern Ontario film community because it's really expanded into like Toronto and Hamilton and in and, and around the area. Thank of you. course, thriving film community, uh, lots of genre stuff coming out. Um, and uh, of course, you know when you when you guys put out or came up with the concept for for the sake of vicious, it goes through the writing process. You've got a script. How did you determine? Um, like, how did you determine? that you were going to direct it together. And also how did you get to the point where you were like, okay, here's how we're going to split this, this, these directing duties up when we get to set, or was that something that was kind of done on the fly when you got there? Uh, well, I think the the deciding that we were going to direct together came together. I, well, Gabe, you were saying it from the beginning, you wanted us to co-direct it. Even yeah. When I was writing I it. Because we talked about it, we were both passionate about it about the story when we meet and talk about the script and stuff, I said, dude, like, why don't you just direct this with me? We'll make sure, you know, it's, it's not some crazy film. We can kind of like share duties. We can take care of different departments. We can do a lot of pre-pro and, you know, just 
have some fun and put it out there. You know, let's kind of, I, I don't even remember. I think it was something like that. Yeah, I don't think there was a definitive moment that was like, okay, we're going to do this. It just sort of gradually happened. And then I think one day in one of our meetings with with Raven Banner and, and, and Avi, it was just sort of like, oh, we're both directing it now, by the way. And nobody questioned it. <laughs> nobody was ever there just like, okay, yeah, sounds good. So... I think I think the biggest thing with it is um, we both have made films on I was our own say, doing yeah. multiple jobs. Yes, and we knew this film was extremely low budget, and by having two directors that could do more because we know how to do other things in pre pro and post and edit and stuff, it just made sense that to like from our backgrounds that we come to do this because then we could pull it off. I wouldn't have been able to pull this off by myself. You right. know and, what I mean? and is that just uh, because I of the just... same for Reese, but um, you know, like it was especially the pre-production, the production, like we had no production designer. We we were the production designer. So, you know. And and so and was the film always this action heavy? Like, I mean, this this is a this is a non-stop movie. Like it is like, I mean, it's, it's funny because, uh, I, I know there's a lot of invasion movies and there's a lot of, uh, there, you know, there's a lot of genre stuff out there, but the reviews for this movie, I think are spot on. And like, when I said, you know, look, you're, you're sitting at 83% Rotten Tomatoes, the majority of reviews are positive and the majority of the reviews really get what this movie is, which is a, uh, somewhat of a, uh, you know, an established setup. And then it's just nonstop action pretty much all the way through chaos violence brutality whatever you whatever you want to call it um it's got everything in here was that always in the script or was that something that kind of just did that kind of develop over time or or how how when did that start like when did that kind of full picture of that film and the and the action and the stunt work and the fights and all that stuff when did that really come into the script was it from the start or was it from it's, it's always been there yeah, right. yeah. It was there he right from the more he can elaborate. He, there was there was more violence and more action. Yeah, the, the script is the script is way more violent and brutal than what we were able to actually get on screen. So um, but the uh yeah, like if you look at the script now or shooting draft, the last 35 to 40 pages is just like chock full of description of action. Like it's just there's no dialogue, it's just block after block of very descriptive action. We knew exactly what it was going to be when we talked about it. I mean, when Phil, when Gabe, sorry, Phil, Gabe, whatever, first pitched that idea to me back in the day, um, action was always a very prevalent part of the third act of the movie. That was always going to be the major, like, we're going to go full bore. And then I, I, I don't mind saying so. I think I may have turned it up to 11 a little bit more than what was originally there. Because I said, well, if we're going to go, we're going to go all the way. Because there was sort of this feeling between us that, let's not worry about anything. Like, cause at the time we didn't, we had no idea what it was going to do. We would have never guessed that it was be where it is now. And we didn't really have anybody holding us back. And we were kind of, you know, thinking to ourselves, you know, sometimes with, with some indie films, they don't feel like they go all the way when it comes to violence. Like there's always this, there's feels like there's just something holding them back a little bit. And I said, no, screw it. Let's, let's just go full bore. Let's go, just go full tilt. And let's make this as brutal as we possibly can. And the script, like Gabe was saying, is 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 way more violent actually than what we were able to get, mostly just due to budget and time. But it's it's pretty close. It's pretty close. Awesome. It could be, it could be a little gorier. <laughs> yeah, the ending was a lot different. Well, not a lot, but I mean, in in like you know, time and, and money, we had to change the ending of the film location wise, yes. kind of last minute. Originally in the script, it was a flooding basement of her house. Um, and uh, the two, you know, Nick and, uh, um, was, yeah, it would have been James. And, and Colin would have been down there uh, yeah. fighting in water and stuff. But Yeah, it was, it was a much more elaborate ending that yeah. uh, maybe was a little too grandiose for the time we had. But we were super close to shooting it. We had to change oh, really? it I think, the day before just because yeah. we ran out of time. It was literally like, at night. Yeah, it was the night before that we were going to go do all the stuff in the basement and just came down to time, money, how exhausted everybody was. And we literally made up the, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but what yeah, is... No, no spoilers, because people what, might not have seen yeah, the film. Yet. What is essentially the ending now when you get to it was sort of made up on the day, on the spot. So okay, that was the I, only I, thing we had to do. 
Uh, so, and let's talk about the setting of this movie because it's like, it's, it's a home invasion film, obviously. Uh, it's got tons of action, like I said, and we're going to get, we're going to talk about all the fight choreography and the stunt work coming up as well. Um, but talk to us about the setting. It's very, very claustrophobic film. It's kind of a one setting, you know, ask, I mean, there's other, there's other parts of the film, of course, but, but mostly the main setting is this house and you destroy the shit out of this house. Um, talk to us about that. Like how, how did, <laughs> like, like it wasn't a set, right? It was an actual house. Yeah, it was an actual house. We re- really, um, the goal at the beginning was for us to build a set uh, just because we knew the extent of the damage and the script had been written to certain specifications that Gabe and I had discussed about, this is what the layout of the house should be to make it work. And um, when it became clear that we couldn't build the house just for financial reason and time and we were the production designers now we kind of had this mad scramble to find this place and we literally got it at the last minute i think maybe three weeks before we started shooting from um uh from a uh, property developers uh outside of town they had bought this house and they're like we're tearing it down we're putting in these new bungalows um, we'll rent the house to you and you can literally do whatever you want to it. And I said, are you sure? They said, absolutely. I said, cause we are going to destroy the fuck out of this house. <laughs> like we're blood wall. We're like, we're going to destroy it. And they said, yeah, no, you can do whatever you want to it and you can leave it in the condition that you destroyed it. So and a lot of that claustrophobia is, is just by nature of that was just the house we got and it was perfect. And, I mean, Gabe, you can talk about, we had to, we had to change a lot on the fly too, from what the script was versus the house we had. Yeah. Like we, you know, we would, I mean, the summer of 2020, 2019, Jeez, that old already the summer of 2019, you know, we were in Reese's kitchen rehearsing this, just him and I, like the action sequences, like, you know, grabbing each other, pushing to get straight against the wall and on the ground and just kind of with this house, with this large house in mind, you know, it was a rate, it wasn't even a large house. It was what was, what was the vision of like a bungalow or something? Yeah. It was, um, it was, it was a bit more of a spacious bungalow. For yeah. Sure. And this was, I haven't even seen that. Like, honestly, when we walked into this house for the first time, I never even seen a house like this before. It was just so small and cramped. Like the stairwell was abnormally small, even for an older home. Like it was just, it was, it was really weird. So we had to adjust everything. And I remember when we were bringing in the furniture, just him and I, you know, we'd be talking about, okay, you know, we put down the sofa that we just brought in and then end up talking. Okay. So remember that scene? Blah, blah, blah. Well, this is going to have to completely change now. Yeah. Um, so it was, that was a challenge. That was, when you think about it, that was probably the. And, and when you, when they were like, listen, you can do whatever you want to this house. Did you get super excited for that third act when you're like, man, we can flood the fucking basement now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, funny enough though, we couldn't actually use the basement at that house. It wouldn't have worked for the location. It was so old yeah. and uh, decrepit that we were actually planning on shooting in somebody else's basement altogether. <laughs> but, but everything else we were super excited for. Um, I think that the scary thing when we got the house though, was just thinking, how the hell are we going to fit our cast and crew in here? Like it's, it's, he's, he's saying it, but until, until you actually stood in that house, it's, it's really hard to, to grasp how small it was. Like it was ridiculously tiny and so, so hot in there too. Once you got everybody. One in the trailer and one in the house. That's right. And then that weird one that was off of the kitchen, they had built a bathroom off of the kitchen that didn't have a doorway. It just had a little curtain that you pulled up. (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well listen uh uh just just by talking like this we got a couple of questions actually about this house um and and funny enough so i'm just gonna throw them up on the screen thanks everyone for your comments keep them coming uh if you do have a question for um for gabe or reese um co-directors of for the sake of vicious throw them in the comment section for whatever platform you're listening to us on i think facebook and youtube pull the most i think twitch does too um but uh yeah please uh post your comments we'll get them up during the broadcast but let's take a look at a few right now we got a, a quick comment here from uh, christian b uh hello recent gabriel i love the film can you tell us about the location of course we just talked about this but just wanted to pull attention to uh, uh to the last part of this comment um uh, i love how it's essentially another character for the film which is totally true like it does it, it's like like a lot of great genre films, the setting or the thing, like the house or the location becomes a character in the film that 
other characters kind of have to interact with. And was that always kind of what you were thinking um, as far as like getting a location like that? Well, I mean, in the script, it was definitely a, a major character for sure which is why we were trying to design it to a very specific design we had in mind but just by as i explained just by the nature of how our production was going um the house itself we we kind of had to adapt to it it's like we walked into a character we found a character and now had to adjust our story to work within the character because of how important the movie the house is to the movie so i mean it was just a streak of luck that it looked the way it did and the way it was built and how tiny and confined and that kitchen and that hallway and the upstairs, it, uh, it, it kind of did a lot of the work for us. And it's, it's been cool to see all the reviews saying like, Oh man, look how great the house is. And like, as Christian here is saying, look at how much of a character it is. And we're sort of there going, we can only take sort of credit for like, it's really kind of just yeah. fell into it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, so a good quick follow-up question here to from the uh, OHFP friends of the show, um, long time uh, um, uh, viewers. Uh, did you shoot chronologically then uh, the script chronologically, if you destroyed so much of the house as you were going along? Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah. In a nutshell. Yeah, we did. We saved most of the action and big stuff for the end. We got the bulk of the drama stuff out of the way in the first week. And then our final two weeks was, pretty much just the last half of the film. So we tried to go room to room. So we started with, okay, we'll destroy this room. Now we'll move to this room and destroy it. Now we'll room, move to this room and destroy it. The hardest one that we kept having to come back to was that damn kitchen. Um, right. We just got progressively more and more worse. And it also shrunk the amount of space we could shoot in it by the end to the point where it was like, you can literally only film in this little section here because everything around it is completely destroyed or soaked in blood. Everything, everything was covered in blood. We didn't <laughs> even worry about continuity in the kitchen when the action mm -hmm. was taking place. Usually it's continuity is something you worry about, but when this is going on in the house, like we had toasters and stuff on the counter and stuff on the fridge. But I remember I was one morning going on recent, I would always be the first ones on set talking, going through everything. And, you know, we'd be fidgeting around. I remember every morning I'd go and try to make things how they were, you know, in the last knowing what the next scene is and fixing how things were before. And then at one point, I think I gave up. I was like, no one's going to yeah. notice. I'm wasting too much time <laughs> with alphabet magnets on the fridge, putting them where they were. You might as well just make it at that point. You might as well just make it more messy, like more destroyed because yeah. 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 Oh, and I remember too, us all fussing about the tables in the, the kitchen, the, the little kitchen dining room set, yeah. like, oh, where the hell are the chairs supposed to be seated? You watch the movie and nobody cares. Like, it's just <laughs> like shit that you worry about. It's like, ah, that table, matter. man, that table, <laughs> that table, that stupid table. So. I've caught them. I've caught them. But, um, I, awesome. So let's just jump through a, a, a bunch of other, we got, we got a, a, a great viewership tonight. Um, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Of course, happy new year to everyone out there. Um, let's just whip through a bunch of these things. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, First and foremost, we mentioned him earlier, but uh, the immortal Jason Rockman, a phenomenal movie, guys. Loved it. Proud to own it. Um, uh, Jason's also thrown in a link on the, the Facebook to the Raven Banner store. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that's actually where you can get the, uh, for the sake of Vicious Blu-ray, uh, you can pick it up from Raven Banner directly or, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, Sunrise as well as Cinema One. Uh, there's Cinema One in Hamilton as well. Uh, Tracy's just piping in here just saying, uh, yeah, there is Hamilton. There is one in Hamilton if everyone uh, needs to, if, if nobody nobody knows. Uh, yeah. Of course, a uh, good uh, friend of the show, uh, our only um, our only two-time guest, uh, the awesome Heather Buckley, all the way from New Jersey, uh, oh, nice. says, The Mall. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, but also Heather, if you're, if you're still listening, it's actually, I, I, I hate to correct you, but it, but it's actually the fucking mall. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, let me see here who else we got. Okay. So in a couple of things, uh, Oh, actually, and we're going to get to this a little bit, but Alexander, uh, of course, a long time viewer says demolisher is one of my all time favorites. Um, and of course he says, uh, damn, that sounds delicious. I I'm thinking he's talking about the fried chicken sandwich, maybe not the, <laughs> the fake blood in the house, but, uh, but who knows, right. To each his own. Um, yep. and, uh, oh, and you know, I, I don't, you know, good thing that Chad's watching. So yeah. uh, I'm on, I'm under the gun now. Uh, yeah. but Hey guys, uh, heroes, good to, good to see you guys for sure. And John McIsaac again, again, uh, Gabe, 
backing you up too. Mary Brown's Big Mary is a solid. <laughs> uh, so fried chicken sandwich recommendation there as well. Um, okay, so let's jump into a couple of things uh, here that we haven't actually talked about yet. Um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, and Rockman has a question here that I think is a great segue, uh, which is that the music is phenomenal um, in the film, of course. Uh, can we talk about how the, how the score came together? And uh, yeah go because <laughs> it really does add a lot to this lot to this film especially as the carnage gets more and more crazier uh, as the film progresses right take it yeah. away yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah who wants to who wants to go i know it's just like i should have pointed i throw you up in the stereo i threw you up in the stereo. there he is there you go, go for <laughs> yeah it. no originally there wasn't going to be a score and then uh we were looking looking for tracks and uh you know Usually you find artists online that music you like and you, you know, you get them to put it in like, you know, or you kind of do your own little bit. Reese knows this, I'm sure in the past with this films, like you, you make it yourself, but we talked for a while about not having much score in this at all. And just having like eerie and ambience and sound design. I wasn't going to do we, like none of us. We were, we weren't essentially going to have any composer. There wasn't going to be like a soundtrack or a score. Right. Um, and then I, I forget what happened, but I had some stuff catalog that I was working on a year prior moody things. And, um, I think, I don't know, Reese, I don't even remember. Did you, you, you heard some of it and you're like, why don't you try when you were in the edit? I sent you, I, what's the story again? Well, it's like Gabe said, when we were, writing well after the script was written and we were kind of doing some of the preliminary work we were we sort of liked this idea of playing it super straight and and not having any score whatsoever and then when we were shooting we were like maybe it'd be fun to punctuate little moments here and there uh but in pre-production we had talked about if there was going to be any score that Gabe would do it because obviously he's he's got a cool musical background and I like the stuff that he had done before so as he said, he had kind of cataloged some some little bits of music that he was working on that he had from previous stuff or stuff that he was doing for this movie that we would listen to on set. And when it came time to do the first edit, um, our very, very first cut, when I, when I sat down to do it, uh, he had sent me just a bunch of random stuff he had. And I just started tinkering around and putting it here and putting it there and putting it here and putting it there. Before I knew it, I scored most of the movie with his stuff. And I was like, oh, this actually works a lot better with some of this music. Like it, it really brings up the tension because, you know, sometimes when, you, when you're in pre-production, the version, like, always, the version that you have in your head is never the version you end up making. So maybe if we had shot the version that we had, it might have worked without score. But once he kind of started piecing it together and saw what we had, it was like, no, we, we really need this score. And then it became sort of a uh, a full frontal attack on Gabe here to be like, all right, like, let's score this thing. And it's just interesting that we went from a movie that was going to have no score to a movie that's now 80 minutes long and has probably 70 minutes worth of original score that, that Gabe did. That, uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun. And I think that was probably my one of my favorite parts was working with you on that score because when we were doing post, it was right at the start of the COVID pan pandemic. Uh, so we couldn't see each other. So I would just, we would just be communicating with each other through texts and phone calls mm -hmm. and FaceTime. And I would send him clips and then he would send me, okay, try this. And then I could put it in and then record my screen. And then he'd be like, Oh, I'm going to change it. Or you remember this. I, I would literally be on the phone with you and be like, okay, it's got to sound like this. And I go, Boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, boom. But it was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, I've got that, dude. I've got it. I've got it. So it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a good uh, collaboration doing that. But yeah. it was all him. He sent me all this great stuff, and then you just sort of pieced it together. And um, but I remember the note we kept going to is just like score it like it is a horror film. You know, like let's just make it scary. It, I want it, it. It should sound uneasy and and intense. And I, I think he definitely succeeded. So. So that's something I actually wanted to talk to you guys about because um, uh, we talked about the house kind of in the location sort of being a character. And I always feel like the music can be a character as well in the film to drive sort of that tension level and to kind of create this sort of sense of, 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 
craziness in 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 most genre films right i mean i always think of like the horror you just mentioned it reese like the horror films like they have these memorable um scores like uh friday the 13th and halloween and like even uh, uh nightmare on elm street um is that uh i mean do you think that's more important for genre films um or or is it just kind of whatever fits the whatever fits the vibe of the film or, or do you feel do you, do you feel like a strong soundtrack and this can go to gabe as well um do you think a strong soundtrack can really really add to 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 genre films especially if you're if you're working within budget limitations yeah well i mean i really think that I mean, it just, again, it depends on the movie, but yeah, I think horror films, genre films, like a score really, really pushes it that extra mile. But you got to be careful though, too, because you got to find that happy balance of, you know, it's got to be a decent score as well. And I, you, you kind of have to start developing a bit of an ear, which is good when you work with somebody like Gabe who has experience doing music and who can kind of go to you and go, yeah, that's not sounding so good. Let's try this instead. It's, um, but I, I think it really has to go project to project in terms of what you want to do. But I mean, like you said, when I think of movie scores, some of the most iconic scores that I can think of immediately come from horror films. I don't, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just a fun playground. Gabe, you could probably answer this better for us. Like, what is it about horror specifically that makes scoring so, so much more of an adventure? I think because of the cues in the horror films, you have a lot of suspense and silence and sometimes with those silence and silences and suspenseful moments you have the actor not saying anything you have scenes with no dialogue and that's where score has to come in and the score will either say like well how intense is this scene what sound are you going to have to audioize or you know that that level of suspense and i think that's where horror films really have this like amazing experience of playing with instruments and sounds um, that's my opinion. I also think too, as filmmakers, you have to be careful and you have to know when not to use score. Yeah. Either. That's a really big thing. There's a lot of cheesy movies that you see with. Yes. And, and Gabe and I, whenever we're watching films, we will always comment on the score and be like, Oh, too much. You know, <laughs> like <it's, laughs> yeah, you know? there's movies that are like the movies suck, but the score is amazing. Yes. Um, I'm not going to name any, but it's like, you know, I own the soundtrack, but I will never watch the movie again. <laughs> uh, I'll name one. Sure. Uh, I thought um, X-Men Dark Phoenix was like one of those yeah. movies where I thought like, I mean, it's Hans Zimmer. So, I mean, whatever, but, well, like, but maybe man. that's, a, maybe that's a cheat, but, uh, but still, I remember watching this. I mean, everyone told me that movie was like, not great. Like worst of the series, blah, 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 blah. And then I watched it and I was like, this music is amazing. Like I want to, yeah, I want to get awesome. these tracks. Like that'll help me work if I listen yeah. to that on a daily basis. So, um, I, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think for, for, especially for you guys, I mean, um, as if you needed something else to do, right, Gabe, you needed to do the, sound, <laughs> the, the full soundtrack as well. You had too much on your play, right? So you're like, oh, Hey, maybe we'll just keep it. Well, actually, it. Like, <laughs> when it came to post, Reese had more on his plate and like, I kind of like, was like, okay, he's editing the film. And then when the score thing came up, it was exciting because it was like, oh, I get to do something now. <laughs> you know what I mean? I get to partake in the, you know, the, the, the edit a little bit more than I would be if he was just doing it himself. Um, so I wanted to talk, that's a, and that's a great segue because I did have a question to this because I get asked this a lot. And I know that um, Gabe, especially you, Reese, I don't think we've ever actually talked about this, but. I'm curious because obviously this isn't your first, this isn't your first rodeo. You've both directed films by yourselves uh, um, prior to this um, and, and movies that have gone on to do some, some really, really uh, commendable stuff. Um, but in the edit, if we're talking post-production, you've got all this crazy footage, you've got all this crazy carnage. Um, of course, you only have the location. You can, it's not like you can go back and do reshoots really in this location with the, with the, with the situation that it was um, you're getting, you're, you're getting everything that you possibly can. How do you how do you edit that down into into like eighty minutes? Like because it's a tight eighty minutes, and it never feels like it's too much, and it never feels like it drags. Um, but was there a longer cut of this film where you had to kind of say, "Oh man, like we gotta we gotta chop this down"? And were you always gunning for eighty minutes, or that's just how it worked out as far as pacing? I thought um, to answer the first part of your question, this is actually one of the easiest movies I've had to edit. I, I don't know why it just came together really, really smooth. Cause I, I, part of it was that I was able to catalog all the footage myself. So I watched everything for about three days before I started editing. 
and I, I, you know, I organized all my files myself. So I knew where everything was. So putting it together was pretty easy. And funny enough, the first cut of the movie is not that much different than the version you have on your shelf back there. It was a really, really smooth process. And the first cut wasn't much longer than what it is now. It's a little bit longer, maybe by, I think it's only five or six minutes, really. I mean, um, I was personally, and I will still stand by this, I was gunning for the movie to be shorter in a, in a, in a perfect world. I wanted it to be 75 minutes with credits. I think we needed to lose another four minutes in the movie, but we were, we were told that it had to be 80 on the dot. So. Gotcha. Well, I mean, it, it's uh, well, like I said, I, I, I didn't, didn't feel like I saw the, the, the premiere of Fantasia and uh, you know, obviously um, we were all kind of watching at home. Uh, but uh, you know, the, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an adrenaline pumping, pumping movie. And I find a lot of films, especially nowadays, and this is not for indie films. It's just for every film. Like I, uh, um, it, it, for some reason it feels like edits are longer than they've ever been before. Every film is way longer than it needs to be. And I always watch films and I always think to myself, man, I wish that was like 10 minutes shorter. I right. wish that was like 15 minutes shorter. Cause it would have just popped a little bit. I, I would have had my attention a lot longer and, and not to, not to call out the matrix Four. um, listen, if you want to, <laughs> if, if you want to hear my, and I'll just, I like, listen, if you want to hear my critique of matrix Four, tune into uh, Rob Bellaby's movie madhouse, Monday, January 10th, uh, I'll be on it if you want to hear my uh, thoughts on Matrix 4 and as well as the new Spider-Man film. But uh, what I was, I had thought about this while I was watching the film and I'm not going to, we're not going to talk about the Matrix, but I'm just saying Matrix 4 is the longest Matrix movie out of all four of them. And I was right. just like, how is that? A, I don't even understand how that's possible. But, and that's one of the reasons I think the first movie works so well. And this is just a commentary on movies in general is it's so tight that it's like, you know, they, they didn't, it doesn't overstay its welcome. And I think that's a real challenge for a lot of filmmakers nowadays to do because it doesn't, don't feel like anyone's really doing it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's funny you're saying that because like I was reading uh, some reviews and, and stuff the last two days and there's some reviews that they're saying like the first half of this film just dragged on forever. And what seemed like in minutes felt like way longer. And I'm like, I don't care what people think because I'm so desensitized to the film now that I'm like, is it? Maybe it is. Or I would never say, no, it's not. Or yes. Like, I'm just so like, well, maybe, I don't know. Um, They're right. Yeah. It is. It's that extra four minutes. I should have cut. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things I, uh, as well, and, and Gabe, I think, I mean, here's the other thing too. It's like, yeah, I wish it was like nonstop action from, from scene one, but you also have to establish characters as well. And that kind of makes the film this, especially this film flow. There's motives, there's characters here that you yeah. actually really do get attached to it. Uh, of course um, you've got an incredible cast. Uh, I would say that this, I mean, it, it, you've got Laura Burke uh, who's an incredible actress. You've got uh, Nick Smith and you've got Colin Paradine who is, for me, awesome because if you've met Colin in real life, he's like the nicest dude in the planet, <laughs> um, and he's like the biggest bastard in this film. Um, so I commend him for for his performance for sure. Uh, but you know, how did that how did that cast come together? Because I mean, I think it starts with Laura. I mean, she's the focal point. She's kind of the main character in this film, as far as like her experience. Like that's who the audience is along for for the ride with. Um, but uh, you know, uh, how did you line up this cast, and and what did they bring to the project specifically to to help the film achieve what it's done? It was a huge addition process. Once Ray Rinder and Abby came on board, they were, you know, they wanted to open up to the entire area. So um, I think, you know, we we had was I forget it was two days in Toronto, and you know, everyone came out to see see what they got, and it was nuts. It was it was a blur. There was a lot of people coming out. Um, and you see all the talent and I think it came down with com combinations um, and, and the right looks for people. I think that's always a, always a big thing. And then you all obviously have, you know, Raven Banner and, and Abby putting their, their, their two cents in, right. It's not just Reese and I, um, you know, we, 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 everyone butt heads with certain people at one point, but at the end of the day, we were all, um, it was an unanimous vote across the table um, with, with who we landed. But I'll let I'll let Reese talk about the Nick and because uh, Nick Nick came on at the very end, didn't he? And Colin yeah. Colin was there from the start. We I think did you you pretty much wrote it for Colin in a sense. Like you wanted is that how it went? And then like Colin had to go through the whole trial just because that's the way it is <laughs> process. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
it's like Gabe said, we did not to mention the Toronto auditions, but we also had dozens of uh, video auditions as oh, well yeah. that we sat through dozens. And it was just so tricky because we didn't really have anybody in mind in our head of who it could be. But you also knew that when, once they started saying the lines, you're like, oh, no, that's not right. Like, that's just not at all the tone. It's either right. played too high, too low, but no, like, happy middle ground. So Laura was great because it was sort of a one-two punch of she was coming off of poor Agnes and Life Changer. And Gabe and I had seen Life Changer the year before we went to go see it at TAD. And we're like, holy shit, she's really good. And it just kind of seemed like a no-brainer because when she she read for the part, you went, well, yeah, there it is. That's 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 the thing we're looking for. Um, Colin, uh, like, Colin's been in everything I've made. He's like my my good luck charm. He's my Robert De Niro, my Leo DiCaprio. Like I, I put him in everything, even if he's just standing in the background somewhere. So when I wrote it, I was just kind of thinking of Colin, you know, <laughs> what a terrible <laughs> thing to write for your friends. <laughs> Who can play a prick? <laughs> yeah, I, wrote, I wrote this for you. Dude, this, yeah. is, this, this is an awful character. I don't, yeah. I don't like this guy. But I mean, I think I mean, I don't want to I don't want to speak for Colin, of course. Uh, uh, but but if, I mean, I think it's I think most actors as well will, will you know, they people that I've interviewed and, and even talked to is as well as like, there's something juicy about a villain, right. Um, oh, absolutely. That you can sink your teeth into. And, and especially if you have like, I mean, going back to Laura as well, like I, I always feel like, and I've, I mean, I saw life changer. Like I didn't, I didn't really know Laura Burke and, and I saw life changer and I saw, I can't remember what else I saw. Um, but before this film, and um, it, she, you know, everyone talks about actors being like, you know, people are like an every man, right? Like there's just like, they could be, they could be you or me or like, or, or whatever. And she's kind of like an every woman in, in, in this movie where she, she's just, you know, she's, she's working mom and she's got like this, uh, uh, you know, this, this horrible experience that's kind of come, come crashing through her front door. Um, and I just feel like she brings a lot of, um, I don't know what a grounded sense, like, like a, like a sensibility to the character where it's just like, it's believable. Right. And I yeah. think that helps the film kind of take off from where it starts to kind of where it ends. Well, for sure. Cause all three characters are so strikingly different in their personality that that's, they have to balance like three different factions of the movie for you essentially. Cause they're the movie purposely doesn't over explain anything. So you're seeing things through their eyes. So you need that kind of one person to be the, you're the audience essentially you're diving in with her um back to your original question though that, that gabe was getting the hardest role we had to cast was was nick smith as chris we couldn't we couldn't find anybody like we literally couldn't find anybody talk about a role that like we we heard read so many and god bless the people who auditioned for us obviously they don't know what our, our thoughts and feelings were they were giving their best but we got so many wrong readings of it that it got to a point where I'm like, I'm not, we were like, I don't even know what a good reading of this character would be anymore. And it was the suggestion of my wife, Aaron, who knew Nick that we should, we should audition him because he didn't come in for any of the auditions. Right. He right. had a brief part in, uh, in defective, but you know, he was like the seven 11 commercial comedy guy. Yeah. He was the chef in the late night double feature. I think that's was right. Like funny. Yeah. Like he's, comedy. Yeah, he does a lot of comedy. He's a very and he's just a funny guy in real life. And Aaron was like, "I'm telling you, I just I think he'd be really intense." And I, just on a whim, I, I sent him the sides and I said, "Can you do a self tape for us?" And the first one he did, we went, "There it is. That's that's how you do it." Um, but much like Colin and everybody, there was still like he had to go through the. We put him through the ropes. He auditioned for us again, and then he did another videotape. And same with Colin, he we did videotape, then we auditioned him again, we still saw other people, you know, we weren't just going to give away the roles, but it was imperative that you found three people who could balance well off of each other, and who could, as, as Gabe said, they had to complement each other, because it's such that first half that people say is too slow, like as Benner, as you rightfully pointed out, I, I love that people love the second, the second half is great. But it does not work without the first half of the movie, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's a drama. It's a stage piece between these three. And if one of those three didn't work, then it would be just a shit show, you know? So, Right. And, if, and, if, and of course, if it was action from, from, 
from second one to the last second on the screen, people would say, well, there's not enough setup and there's not enough. I mean, exactly. I always say you can't please everyone. You can no, try, yeah. you can certainly try and you should try to please everyone, but you're not yes. going to. Yeah. So it's make the fun. attempt, but don't be, don't be, don't be surprised if, if you can't, but uh, no. uh, listen, let's jump into a, a few more comments here. Uh, I've got some people still tuning in. Uh, just let me see. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, oh, speaking of, of, I don't know if this is the same Nick. I don't, I'm not sure, but, uh, Nick man, legend hero. These guys are my favorite directors <laughs> to work for hell of a project. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, if just a quick follow up, he said, uh, tell him about the mirror. <laughs> I, I don't know if you can tell us that story, but, uh, I would love to hear it. Well, that's, that's, uh, that was, uh, Nick, oh, he's one of our stunt guys. Yeah. Okay. So Nick, Nick's a great game. You tell the story about the mirror. You tell it so well. It's the living room mirror. I feel like I've told it so many times. <laughs> I want to. You never told me, man. I want to hear it. All right. So this is Takeover Tuesday, baby. I don't like know what time of night it was. It was after we ate in the trailer. There's behind the scenes photo. The stunt team is exhausted. Everyone's just kind of like laying on whatever they can, sitting on chairs. You know, like they're just slouching. It's probably like eleven o'clock at night, and you know TJ's up and everyone's up. So there's this mirror by the front door that Reese and I bought at Valley Village, and we bought it thinking, oh yeah, you know. We got to be careful because like there's mirrors and once you put mirrors on a set where there's tons of action something happens it's going to break the shatter on the ground got to clean it up someone could get cut you know right the safety but whatever it was by the front door it was like a it was like a stop sign the yeah. mirror was like a huge kind of like hexagon stop sign from from what i remember but we saw and we're like oh you know it's pretty flimsy like whatever so we had this scene where um Nick comes down and uh, gets the guy and they topple a little bit against the wall. And then they do like a, you know, a turn, push, shove thing and get, he gets thrown into the mirror. So the camera was on the stairs looking down. And I remember, you know, um, Adam would get all, get all padded up. He's all the pads, his like foam underneath everything. Like he's like zipped with his mask on. Like, okay, if the mirror breaks, he's going to be, He's going to be okay. And he was overly confident with it. So, you know, scene comes, blah, 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 blah. We're rolling. And Nick just throws him into the mirror. We're like, oh. And he just bounces off the mirror. <laughs> We're like, oh. And he's like, ah, oh, man. We're like, whoa, it didn't break. Okay, well, let's let's try it again. Take two. Same thing. Da, 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 da. Boing. Bounces off the mirror. We're like, okay, what the <laughs> hell's going on here? So we go up to the mirror. We're like, is this actually glass? <laughs> it's like a plexi mirror because you know it could be like a plexiglass mirror where it's not even real glass and this is bending i still don't know why that mirror didn't break i think we on the sixth take we had to get tj to come and he had this little like thing he had he went and scored the sides of it so it could break even when he did that the mirror would not break adam was just bouncing off it and i think adam was getting um, more like more annoyed and bruised because he, it's like throwing yourself into a wall constantly um, is going to hurt. And I feel like that's he, like, he didn't even care if, you know, at that point it broke and cut. He, we just wanted that mirror to break. So eventually TJ went in and got a little thing. And even then it was, uh, it was hard. And then eventually it broke, but even when it broke, it was kind of like uneventful. It like, was very underwhelming. Yeah. We were like, <laughs> like what it did. We're like, Oh, that's it. Like that was it. You yeah, know, only, like, only, only, uh, like, only like three and a half years bad luck, right? Not yeah. Seven. Well, I think it's on the behind the scenes, right? The, the it mirror. is, and you have to understand by that point on the production, we were we were getting spoiled with how much we could destroy in that house, and we had a pretty good success ratio of like bodies being thrown into things and destroying them because we had done the bathroom scene already, and Adam did a pretty successful back slam into right. the the bathroom vanity and it smashed and shattered and exploded. And we're like, this one's going to be a walk in the park. This is the cheapest piece of shit we got from Valley Village. It'll break. It's going to break it. in a heartbeat. And it just, it took forever. This stupid mirror that was, so it got to the point where you're like, why are we even doing this? You know, yeah. like, this, is, this is such a stupid stunt. And the other thing too, about that old house is because it was built so long ago, like the walls were, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a, not an architect. I don't know what they were made out of, but concrete it was like trying to punch through concrete. So throwing yourself into them, 
Like you're asking a lot out of a person. So what you're saying is like they used to make things better than they do. Now. Yes, they did. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't. They didn't think to themselves. You know what? Um, <laughs> probably in like a, about fifty years, the some guys are going to come in here and try and destroy this house while making. Yeah, it exactly. Home, right? <laughs> um so uh, i want to talk about the stunt work and uh let's get there i just want to throw up a couple more comments because uh because everyone's kind of been chiming in uh, tonight which is super awesome thanks everyone for tuning in and thanks again for uh um, um checking us out on whatever platform you're checking out checking out the live feed on uh, of course we're broadcasting live to facebook twitch twitter and youtube and of course uh, after the fact if you miss this uh, you can obviously watch the rerun on uh, youtube and we'll be retransmitting to all the major podcast platforms including apple podcasts and spotify or wherever you pick up your favorite podcasts um please check them out and uh, you can hear this whole interview. We do definitely appreciate your support. Um, just a, a funny thing in here from our good buddy, Daryl. Uh, Gabe, is that really you? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to assume that's a matrix reference, Daryl. Uh, and uh, so I should read that again. Uh, Gabe, is that really you? Whoa. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and just a, a follow-up. We were just talking about Laura Burke um, uh, from our uh, you know good friend, Tracy. Uh, as a single mom, I can validate that Laura made it very believable. Um, it made me uncomfortable, but in a good way, uh, watching her in the film, which oh, is uh, which, which is fantastic. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure this is probably a friend of yours, but uh, uh, David uh, says, David oh. Moffat Sound uh, says, one of the films I'm most proud of to work on uh, when we do Vicious, yes. uh, Vicious 2, for the sake of Vicious 2, Ramona's Revenge. Dave, Dave Moffat was our, was our sound guy on set and he was, he was, he was our hero. I, I can't believe the patience he had with us. Yeah. David has worked on. I feel, there's a, I feel there's a story there. No, no, no. He's, he's a guy. Who's there is done, a story, but I don't know if I should tell. He's done dozens of movies. Like he's done all these Hallmark movies, tons of them. And he came on to our little low budget movie and worked for a severely reduced rate. We didn't have a place for him to stay. He drove back and forth every day. He did. Sometimes, oh my God, hours that we shouldn't have done, like 16, 17, 18 hour days. And other than one or two times, he never complained. He was just, he was the there. Thing, yeah. The yeah. The biggest thing in my head on set every day was, I don't care what happens today, as long as Dave doesn't get annoyed. <laughs> I don't care if the camera team gets annoyed. I don't care if any, I don't care if he's get, but if Dave starts getting annoyed, which he probably did, but he kept it to himself. But if you didn't, and I'm like, okay, that's all I, that's essentially at the end of the day, I always wondered in my head, I'm like, fuck, I hope Dave is like, okay with the, this the environment, this working condition right now, because. D Dave was know. the stress test. If Dave got angry, then you knew we've gone too far. <laughs> no, you know, it was getting the, the only sign that I could tell was the size, because when it was 3 a.m., likely so, you would hear this. <sighs> These <laughs> <laughs> sighs coming from his room. Yeah, it's like like when I said when I said I'm good with long days, I meant like 12, 13 That's hours, not sixteen. It was like he was really yeah. good. With it's funny. It's like I mean, uh, I, I just watched um, uh, on Netflix. They have the the that show the the movies that made us right. And uh, I watched the around Christmas. I watched the Home Alone one. And uh, I guess um, it's kind of a similar story. Is that uh, I think because John Hughes produced that and Chris Columbus produced directed i directed think it, yeah. yeah so so john hughes called him a favor and got john candy to come in and film one day and yeah. so that's why john candy's in home alone when he's at the uh at the at the depot and he and he he gives uh uh kevin's mom a ride home right yeah. and i guess john candy did it for the minimum and he said he'd work one day so he did it for like and they had the sheet and it's i think they paid him like 430 bucks or th <laughs> 435 bucks but they kept yeah. him there for like 19 hours, 19 hours yeah and he was just pissed by the end. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I mean, John Candy's amazing, and it's like yeah, absolutely uh, glad yeah. he's in that movie. So, but I guess like yeah, it's like even guys like John Hughes push their luck, right? With uh, yeah, with, with a lot of people. So, yeah. uh, oh, and uh, just a quick follow up to here, uh, uh, Nick, the stunt guy says, uh, "Hey, I'm in for Ramona's revenge." I don't yeah, know why this is Ramona. Romina. <laughs> Romina. Oh, sorry, it's Romina. Yeah, come on, guys, you worked on oh, the okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what it's going to be called? <laughs> Romana. <laughs> uh, and, 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 listen, I, and you know what? Uh, I can tell you, I can tell you that uh, David, your sound guy, totally heard that story because he's just piped in again and said, "I've still got blood on my sea stand." <laughs> <laughs> I just well, remember Dave going like, up. There was people. Slate. There was people on our set who, um, maybe this was their first time on a feature film set. Completely. And Dave, and the, you know, and Dave is like a 
veteran, industry veteran. So it was like, wow, like he's used to being on sets with people who have been doing this for 10 plus years, right? And you hear, here you have people mingling with Dave and Dave's posture, his composure, like honestly, like it was a level of professionalism that I think we needed on set for new people in film going, that's how you behave, that's how you act. Like patience, calm, but I mean, I, 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 I think, I don't know. I think Dave should have lost it at least once or twice, but he didn't, to be honest. <laughs> Not around us, at least. So <laughs> that's true. So let's and let's. Um, uh, we've got a couple of things that I've talked to you. I know we're over the hour, Mark. Uh, thanks. You guys go okay to stick around for a little while longer. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, this isn't going to be a three hour episode. I promise. Um, thanks everyone for. I um, mean, we we still have a, a pretty good audience tonight. So uh, thanks everyone for sticking around, checking this out. Um, and of uh, of course, this movie is heavy on. Uh, fights physical violence uh stunt work uh can we dive into that and talk us like talk us through about how that kind of came like what was the process to do this because i've seen your other films uh it's not like they don't have violence or or you know special effects or choreography or anything like that but not like this and i think that's fair to say um what went into that process like what went into that uh, into kind of where did you start you knew it was going to be heavy on sort of like <laughs> the destruction of this house um how did you go about choreographing that stuff and setting it up before you filmed? I mean, we have to give that credit to the stunt team, right? Nick, yeah. uh, TJ, um, Adam, uh, Dorian. Uh, what's the other guy's True Northcraft. Um, what's his name? <laughs> Don't put me on the spot. <laughs> I know. Okay. Boris. Boris. Yeah. Is. <laughs> um, you know, those guys were like, it was, it was awesome because like, it just felt like they were so militant. Like yeah. Reese had the script, he gave, mm -hmm. you know, we go through the scene with them, but they kind of took it. Like they, they already knew what they had to do, but they took it and they kind of made it their own. There was like a second unit direction almost on their part. And then they would show us and we were pretty much, I mean, I was fine with whatever they were doing, but they, they pretty much directed those, those, those fight scenes, the momentum, the, you know, who, what guy was coming in? Like they were really throwing their ideas. Um, and they, they, we owe it a lot, a lot to them. Cause um, it's hard to make that stuff look realistic. Yeah. And, and, and people know, was, and, and it's not like, you know, um, it's not like a, it's like a short film or a, a commercial or anything like that. Like it's a continued, it's a continued state of, of, you know, violence and threat throughout the film. Uh, and people know that's a movie, right? Like people know that it's, that it's stunt, uh, uh you know stunt work and it's 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 not real um yeah. so it's very hard to get it to feel as visceral as it does in this film like did you guys was there anything in particular that that you kind of or any scenes in particular that you were like as soon as you shot it you were like this is, we're on to something here like things are really clicking here i think uh -huh. i think it kind of always was like but i going back to what you're saying like reese and i always wanted the violence in this to be visceral we didn't want it to be mm -hmm. like the punching and the kicking, you see a lot of that um, or suddenly you have these characters that know how to punch and know how to kick. And I, I think Reese said it best. These guys are guys who were just having dinners with their families and they got the call. Like they're not trained to fight like in the characters right. they weren't trained, like in the movie, these henchmen, they weren't like trained ninjas or anything like that or martial artists. They were like one guy, you know, was probably having dinner and gets the call from his mob boss and has to go out. So the fighting had to be, you know, grounded in a sense, not fantastical. Right. Cause they, none of them are expecting to show up to this house and, and, and feel the beating that they get. Um, so basically we didn't want Kung Fu, you know, we wanted it to just feel like you had watched a bar fight or you were in the middle of a bar fight. And it was very important to feel like, you got to be like you're in it. Uh, so we made that very clear. And I think it, it was definitely in there in the, the script when we were writing it, just how the, the fights were supposed to be like awkward and clumsy and uncomfortable. Um, but like I said, we got TJ Kennedy on board who you'd worked with on the demolisher. He was there on the demolisher, right? And he did all the stunts for me on defective. So he was immediately brought on board with Adam and they were both our stunt supervisors so we broke down all the fights with them. So basically, let's just take a day. So we'll say the bathroom fight day. This is how a fight scene would, would a fight day would work out for us. So we'd get them on set. 
we'd show them the location, which they had a pretty good idea of. And they'd been discussing beforehand sort of what we wanted based on the script. And then we would let Adam and TJ go into the space, say the bathroom, for instance, by themselves. And they would work out the stunt for about five to six hours, maybe less, going through every single beat. They'd bring us in and be like, what do you think of this? Yes, no. Okay, great. And then when they're done, they bring us in and say, we're going to do this. We can hit this for the safety of the actors. We'll do this. We'll do this. And we'll do this. And it's going to be what I liked to do is I I always told TJ and Adam, break it down into stages so we can shoot in chunks. So like, this is stage one. This is stage two. This is stage three. This is stage four. The bathroom fight's probably like five different stages. And they would just do it chunk by chunk. And funny enough, they they were rehearsed enough that doing the fight scenes ended up actually being some of the easier things to do in the movie because it was just a very coordinated dance of here's the space. Let's just focus on this little part here. Okay, great. We've got that out of the way. It's done. Here's the next part. We've got that out of the way. It's done. And they're very safe, uh, very professional about it. And also have to give a lot of credit to our camera team because he got Alistair, who was our camera operator and Alex who would just literally throw themselves into the action like if you talked about what's the scene where you go, oh, it's working. For me, it was when we did the bathroom fight. Yeah. Like once once we were in it and going through it, uh, you were like, yeah, this is the fight. This really works. And you know, it's 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 almost it's it's like Gabe said. I know we directed it, but at the same time, I, you have to give them almost all the credit for how well those scenes turned out because they really dictated it along with the camera team about how to pull it off and how to make it work. And we're just the kind of there to finesse the little fine details of it and the character performances and make sure we're hitting the beats. But uh, yeah. it was it was like this really perfect dance. And it would only get slowed down if we had to do special makeup effects because obviously that becomes a whole operation unto mm-hmm. itself. So Yeah, I always feel like they, like, I don't know why I think of Michael Bay, but like I always feel like these guys need to be working with Michael Bay. <laughs> because the amount of, like... Um, Bayhem. It almost feels like they were a special ops team that were yes. hired to come to our set to do the stunts. That that's what it felt like. Like, and I think one night they slept in the trailer in the cold and they didn't like that's how yeah. hardcore these guys were. Like yeah. they like yeah, it was it was unreal. I can't wait to work with them again on something. And, and they took real hits at some points too. We didn't ask them to do it. That's something they decided because it's like it's gonna look better if we just take the re- they're padded, obviously. And that's a lot of the reason they had the masks is because yeah. we're reusing the same guys over and over and over again. But uh, yeah, no, they were great. I think a military, yeah, that's the best way. They were like a COVID secret ops team that we we got. I mean, Boris himself was like, he was <laughs> training. Feel like he is. <laughs> yeah, we feel like he is. Like he he trained people. He would train people how to get out of like home invasion scenarios. Like he was teaching Laura how to get out of her, out of, uh, you know, being tied up and hog tied and stuff like yeah. that. So and he knew how to pick locks and everything. These guys had some had some that's crazy shit up there. making things. an action film, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know that stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he's got a lot of fans out here. We got Christian piping in here, Boris, uh, yeah. and Nick saying Boris. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> I got it eventually. So. Yeah. And I feel I feel like it's like you know, and my nickname is going to be Natasha. <laughs> Doris. Boris. Doris. Yeah. Boris is the one who gets his throat slit at the at the very end. Yes, yes. Whoa, does. spoilers. Whoa, yeah. spoilers. Okay, some guy dies in this movie. I don't yeah, think that's yeah. away too much, but uh, <laughs> uh, awesome. Um, I mean, I think that um, uh, I did have another, you know what? There was a question that came in here. I, I was wondering if I could get your take on it too, because um, I feel like uh, uh, you guys would have some experience doing this. Um, uh, just a question from uh, the OHFP. Of course, long time viewers of the show. I uh, appreciate your support, guys. But uh, they are filmmakers themselves, small filmmaking team operating out of London, Ontario. Uh, but they're saying, uh, what advice would you have for someone who is uh, you know, also has to shoot a feature in one location, smallish, ho- smallish house, uh, in a short amount of time in the winter? Anything that is like, you know, just top that comes right to the top of the top of the pile there to say, hey, make sure you do this. Location permits and uh, making sure you have parking available for your cast and crew. Okay, parking. Gabe, any advice right off the top of your head? Those are good ones. Parking and location Location permits. permits And then maybe just even like just like work really fast and 
<laughs> I don't know. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, location. It depends on the, your location, right? Like, if you're shooting in winter, so winter is going to be a character in your film. So think about B-roll, right? Because if you're making an, an independent film on one location, um, you're going to need something to to split it up a little bit so you're not just staring at the one location the whole time. So think about B-roll and kind of what's outside this location, like anything. Um, that's the first thing that I would probably okay. pop in my head. Yeah, great advice. Like it's, it's less about the location too. It's also got to be about the team you put together that's working with you on the movie because the team's going to go a lot of the way. I mean, if you have the location and you have the area and you have your script, that's great, but you need the team that's going to pull it off with you and do it correctly. So, Okay. Awesome. No, I think that's great advice. Uh, hopefully that helps you out. Uh, thanks for the question for sure. Um, now, uh, we're wrapping up, uh, kind of coming down to, we're kind of going to finish up, but I would be remiss if I didn't put you guys through our rapid fire, uh, question segment, um, which, uh, I don't know if you guys know about, um, uh, but, uh, we do a rapid fire five question set, uh, for all of our guests on here. Um, um, and, uh, just to let everyone know, uh, rapid fire is brought to you by, uh, brought to us by, and everyone else out there by Wellington breweries, Hellas lager, uh, take advantage of Wellington. Wellington, Wellington's free local delivery. Uh, visit their brewery retail store um, in Guelph, Ontario, or pick up some of your can, some of your favorite beers in cans at your uh, at your LCBO or wherever you pick up your adult beverages. Uh, Hellas Lager, Hellas, yeah. Um, so, you guys ready to do this? You guys want to do rapid fire? Uh, you don't really have a choice, so uh, yeah. um, we're gonna do it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, here we are. Okay, here we go. Five questions. Here we go. Uh, putting you guys on the spot. Um, okay. Speaking of in rapid fire question one, yes or no. Speaking of invasion films, is the film The Raid better than Assault on Precinct 13? Yes. Gib? Yes. Oh, okay. No. Uh, <laughs> Typical game. <laughs> Typical game. <laughs> Could have seen that one coming a mile away. Did you hear my? Did you hear the surprise in my voice? I was yeah. like, "Wow!" You know what's funny? It's How like, can that be? Are you talking about the remake or the original? The, the original uh, was Sultan well, Precinct Thirteen. Yeah, the original was. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you can't was, really compare those movies, though. Like, that's a weird. That's why I say no, because you can't uh, compare them. I, you know what, on the raid, it's funny. It's like, uh, we just, uh, tried to watch this over the holidays. We did, we didn't get to it, but we were debating. We actually ended up watching cliffhanger instead, which is kind of, I guess, not really a Christmas movie, but winter movie. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, shout out to John Lithgow, Trinity killer. Um, but anyway, like, uh, for, for the raid has the best tagline. I can't remember if it's a review or just the tagline for the film. And it's like, uh, uh it says it's a hundred minute movie. It says one minute of romance and 99 <laughs> minutes of pure carnage. I think yeah. that's the tagline. And I had forgotten how awesome that tagline is, but, um, yeah, I love that movie. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I love the raid as well. Uh, I think it's like one of the best action movies maybe ever made. Yep. Um, but, uh, okay. Moving right along. Okay. Rapid fire. You got to pick one. Uh, an intergalactic triple threat match is going down for complete control of the outer rim. Boba Fett, Mando, Psycho Gorman. Who wins? Boba Fett. Oh, shit. For being realistic. Okay, so all three of these are possible contenders. It's a three, It's a triple threat match. They're all going to fight each other at the same time. Who comes out? Boba who comes Fett, out? man. Psycho Gorman's got a lot of powerful shit going on. You know, he conjured a lot of stuff. And he was tapping into some other dark universe shit that I don't think Mando Boba Fett could. So you put it this way, but Psycho Gorman's got like crazy other shit. He could eat them. He could like he could take shots. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go with Psycho Gorman on this. Yeah. Mando would get killed off right away. So then it would come down to Boba and Psycho Gorman. Yeah. Depending if depending if there's a Sarlacc nearby, right? Now, yes. The thing with Boba, <laughs> Boba is actually way more intelligent than Psycho Gorman. And I know Boba would find a way, find Psycho Gorman's weakness fairly quickly and annihilate him. Now, I go back to that because if you watch Attack of the Clones and you watch Jango Fett, his father, Jango Fett, essentially a normal human being or humanoid person, goes against Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Jedi Knight. This is an Obi-Wan Kenobi in training. (laughs) He's going against Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Jedi Knight in the rain. And pretty much almost, well, he does beat him. Um, so then if you like, okay, can I, je- what about a Jedi versus Psycho Gorman? How would that fare up? A Jedi would kill Psycho Gorman. So no, then you no. go, okay. So that's what I do. I go, okay, 
Depends. Depends which Jedi, man. Is there, is there, are those? Are you talking about the Jedi's that are like in uh, like Palpatine's chamber in Revenge of the Sith that like go down in two seconds, or are we talking like Vader? I'm talking train Jedi, or not Vader? Anakin, Obi Wan, Luke. I don't think Psycho Gorman can die though. If, if the movie has led me to believe that, well, then, so. then 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 it's then it's not really. A, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, but this is this is a real scenario. This is a very real scenario. Yeah, no, this has to be decided tonight. Yeah, man. so I'm putting my money. Listen, they're all very good fighters, excellent choices. But if I had a gun to my head, I'd be like, no, nope, I'm going to go with Psycho Gorman here. So, okay, okay, awesome. Uh, okay, so moving right along, uh, rapid fire. Uh, help us out. Uh, you're each writing down your co-director's first and last name. How many E's are you writing down? First and last name combined. Sorry, like for Reese. You're writing Reese's name down. Reese is writing your name down. And go. Six. Mine's easy. Three, I think. Yeah. I'm going with six E's. Well, but I'm writing his name, right? Yeah. yeah. Three. I don't yeah. have three E's in my name. That's correct. Gabriel Carrere. Oh, right. First and last name combined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What are you, five or six? That's the first number I came to my head. E, E, E for your first name. E, 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 E. Yeah, six. Yeah. Yeah, I think you counted seven E's there. But yeah, but your answer is six. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. That is correct. Awesome. Uh, okay, so rapid fire, tell us more. Um, comparing Halloween Kills and the original Halloween 2, are you a fan of the Laurie Strode, Michael Myers reveal or no? And explain yourself. Like the reveal of them being brother and sister? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I always like Halloween too. I don't know why it gets so much hate, and I love Halloween Kills. I think it's amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, so explain myself. Are you a fan of? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And 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 why? Why do you? Why do you like it? Why do you like that reveal? Uh, I'm assuming that everyone's seen Halloween Kills, but well, Halloween Kills are not brother and sister. That's right. Um, for some reason, I don't know why. I mean, I like. Wait, uh, comparing on business. Are you a fan of Laurie Strode's reveal or no? Oh, so I'm a fan of the Halloween Kills one. No, no. Are you a fan of the the reveal that Michael Myers and Laurie Strode are siblings in the original Halloween Two? Do you like that reveal? I do like that. I think for that, it propelled that franchise. I like all the other Halloween movies, like the original ones too. And I think that just gave another kind of yin yang dynamic. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of it. Cause you know, that was a major, it, it's, you know, a, more of a creep factor too, you know, like her brother is after her rather than just some. It, it's funny. I'm surprised they didn't carry that over because um, I always thought Halloween one and two were pretty strong. Like obviously the first ones, I mean, the first one is probably the best out of the entire franchise. I don't think, a lot of people disagree with that comment, but, um, but I always thought Halloween too. And I just watched, I just watched the screen factory 4k, uh, looks amazing. And it's, of course, it's not quite as good as the first one, but it does kind of carry on like it's right afterwards and stuff. And I'm surprised that I remember watching the, the, the remake, like the Halloween, what, I can't remember what year, 2018, I think, right. Like the first, the first of this new yeah. kind of yeah. series. And I was surprised that they didn't, they said, well, everything, this is picking up after the original first movie, not the original first two movies. I thought it was surprising a little bit, but so Benner, what's I, sorry? We're going on a brief tangent here, unless you have to run. But I got to know because you're such a movie fan. What's your opinion on these new series of films coming out that all of a sudden decide to retroactively be like, okay, we're just ignoring the sequels? Oh, okay. Do. Well, which like what? Give me an example. What do you mean? Well, with exactly what the new Halloween in 2018 did, where they're like, we're just making a sequel to the oh, first movie. We're going to ignore all the other. Because this all, is becoming a very popular thing. Uh, Terminator, all, have they done that? Terminator did it. So so Dark Fate was like, Terminator 1 and 2 are, are, are what we're going with. This is basically like, quote unquote, like the next Terminator 3. Yeah. Um, And uh, I mean, it's it's funny. It's like the, like the whole reboot cool thing. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I liked, I think if it's done, I mean, it depends on how, Oh, alien. I, um, no aliens didn't do that. They were going they were, to, they were going to, they were, yeah. they were going to say that, 
but even that they didn't necessarily like erase those movies. It kind of explained them away. But I mean, I guess it depends on how good that movie is. Um, I really liked the the new Halloween. I, I wasn't a fan of Halloween kills personally, but I really, really liked the, the, the first one, like the first Halloween. I thought it was great. I thought like, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis coming back and kind of being this sort of traumatized, uh, um, you know, older woman who has kind of lived with this for 40 years and stuff. I, I just thought they lost the thread in the second in Halloween kills a little bit, but, but it really depends on how good the movie is. Like I, okay. like I, yeah, it, it's tough, man. Like, I mean, it's hard. I mean, they're always going to make sequels. They've just, I think, I think the first movie to do it, well, it probably wasn't the first movie to do it, but the first big successful movie to do it was Jurassic world where they were like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to like, you know, we, we're going to reboot this movie and this is how yeah. we're going to do it. And it made like 1.6 million or trillion right. billion at the box billion office yeah. worldwide. And they were like, Holy shit. And everyone was like, what, what IPs do we have? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I think it's easy to kind of take an IP that a studio owns and, and make something new. I just hope that there's some acknowledgement of the original films. And, and uh, I mean, my favorite, I think, well, I don't know if it was my favorite, but my, one of my favorite films of the year was the new Ghostbusters. Like I loved it personally. Right, right. Um, I still need to see that. Like it's, it's just fantastic. Okay. So, you know, again, no spoilers. Cause I know some people haven't seen it, but it, they really attribute the first film. They kind of acknowledge the second film, a, like a little bit, not really, but, um, but they still do it very um, tactfully, I guess. Uh, and, and, and maybe that's a new franchise. Maybe it's not, who knows, but, uh, but I really feel, feel like as long as the original stories are sort of, uh, are, are honored a little bit or, or just respected. I think that's, that's a big thing, but I'm not a necessarily a huge fan of um, retconning things to the point where it's like, Oh, well, this is why, you know, I mean, I feel like there's this thing where like everyone needs to know where everything came from. Right. It's like, Oh, that's yes. how he got his shoes. Oh, that's how he got his like, and it's like, it's redundant. Like nobody cares. Yeah. And, and I did read an article, sorry, not to go on a big tangent, sorry to our viewers or our listeners, but I, I feel like this is important. This is important stuff. But, um, I read an article lately. I can't remember. I can't remember what site, um, but they said that bringing back the, the problem is, is that they're bringing back characters like legacy characters and all of these films basically for the most part. And they're not really adding to them. They're not really adding to their character arc. It's like that story sort of ended and then they have brought these characters back and, and why, like what, what's the yeah. reasoning for that? Was it because they didn't get any closure? Okay. Well, that's one thing. Um, or is it because they don't, um, or, or they just want to make a bunch of money. And I think that's, that's the problem is that is that as soon as you bring back these legacy characters where, um, y- you know, you, you, you try and make this sort of like other sequel. I mean, it really has to work or it's, or it's, or it's no good for me. I thought ghostbusters afterlife, I thought worked really, really well. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, like I imagine if they announced like, Hey, we're going to do back to the future four. And it's like, yeah. oh, I don't really don't know about that. I mean, nobody wants to see that movie. I don't think. Right. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, be careful, but I mean, it's been done so much now that I just like my, 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 my thing with that is that I hate when there's like a trilogy or a series of films. That's pretty solid. Like it's got a middle, a beginning and an end and, and just the ending is, and then they try and do something else with it. And it's just right. kind of like, well, there's this addendum now on this series that maybe nobody will watch or it's ruined things that's, that have come before it. Right. So, right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Right on. Anyway, anyway, sorry. So I took way too no, much. No, 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 it's great. I wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> Slow motion fire, man. Not rapid fire. Okay. Anyway, uh, last question, rapid fire. What do you want? Uh, you're tearing out a wall in an abandoned house during a film shoot. And you find five hundred dollars in cold hard cash. We know you're not giving it up. What are you buying with that money? Okay, so I have to have fun with it. I can't. I can't pay bills or anything, right? That's forbidden. Well, you. I mean, that's you, not exciting, you, you, though, right? Yeah. You you, I guess you could pay bills, but I mean, <laughs> would, would you pay bills with that? <laughs> five hundred bucks, man. I got to pay my phone bill. Sweet. Yeah. Exactly. There we go. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Gabe. No, it just depends on the bills, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, is bills I, an option? Okay, but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. I feel like if you fi- if you paid a bill, then you'd look at your bank account and say, well, now I don't have to pay that bill, so now I can go spend like the $500. There you go. So you still have an extra $500. Yeah. Right, so you're still going to spend it on something, right? So I think, it, I think it should be you need to go spend it. Like, you can't pay. You can't pay bills. All right. Okay, good. Yeah, so it's just $500. You can't put it on bills. 
what would you do? Guys, <laughs> I'm asking you. You go first. <laughs> I'd probably go to Taco Bell. <laughs> 250 tacos, man. Get in the car, like, oh, dude, like, we're going to talk about, or Mucho Burrito, probably talk about. And then probably a record store. Uh, Probably go to um, Encore Records in Kitchener or Orange Monkey in Kitchener and get some stuff there because there's like stuff in those. There's like, I'd get some records that I wouldn't normally spend like 40 bucks on. I'd be like, I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that now. I'm going to get that. But now it's like you see these records, you're like, oh, no. Or probably buy a 4K Blu ray player. Christian's going to laugh at that one. There you go. Dude, 4K is amazing. It's fantastic. I love it. Reese? Um, yeah, I'm probably going to have to go the Blu ray route. Uh, I don't know what specifically it would be, but I know I haven't bought any in a while. So I think I'd want to get something super special with it. Um, like I'm trying to track down that. Uh, we're talking about Halloween. I really want that Shout Factory Halloween set that they had years ago. That's out of print that you see oh, pop up on eBay. It's going to come back. Um, I would like to get that so I can add it to my Friday the 13th Shout Factory collection. <laughs> uh, oh, God. I mean, food's always – like, I'm, I'm a sucker. I could go to a restaurant and blow $500 on food. I happily would. Is I don't know what that lobster restaurant would be. Lobster tails or what? Yeah, no, it probably something fancier for sure. Five hundred bucks. Yeah, I'd be taking somebody out and being like, "Let's just go." You go to town. cherry blossom and not feel guilty after. Oh my god, sushi! Yeah, five hundred dollars worth. This. Oh, I, I think we'd be pretty sick after that. So, I've seen uh, what a hundred dollars in sushi gets us, and that almost kills us. So, yeah, I That's mean, a tough one. yeah, shout out to cherry blossom. They got these awesome uh, mussels that they have with like cheese and mayonnaise. They're a. It sounds weird, but it's they're amazing. Get those if, you're, if, if you, okay. yeah, if you go to the all you can eat. They're, they're fantastic. If you if you like that stuff, if you like seafood and mayo, muscles. And, all right, all and right. Cheese. <laughs> well, I know this is at us, but five hundred dollars to you. What are you going to do? Uh, I don't know. I should, well, you know, I would. Pro- I mean, I my my hobbies are collecting, right? So mm-hmm. I love I love um I love collecting uh, physical media. A lot of people, especially everyone who watches the show knows that. So uh, movies and music. Um, so I'd probably go out and kind of knock off a few things off my, uh, my wish list, Right. So probably some vinyl CDs, Blu-rays. I'm an yeah. old guy. So I collect kind of like all the different medias, but uh, no tapes, no tapes for this guy, just the CDs and records and Blu-rays, right. but four, four Ks, especially, I mean, four K to me is like pretty awesome. And there's, it's like 4k is the thing that, that I've spent the most money on, um, for an individual title than I ever have before. And yeah. and I try and keep it, I try and keep it under control, you know, but it's, it's tough when it's like one of your all time favorite movies. Uh, yeah. I just did a review on like the true romance thing that was coming out of arrow. Yeah. The arrow release of true romance in 4k. Yeah. Coming out of the UK. So you had an order from the UK and it's expensive to get right. And shipped yeah. and all that stuff. So yeah, I'd probably just blow it on that. Right on. Nothing significant. Um, no. Listen, listen, uh, guys, uh, thanks again for doing uh, rapid fire. Uh, that's the end. So you passed. Thank you so much. That's probably the longest rapid fire we've done. But uh, <laughs> hey, hopefully we, uh, uh, of course, I'm to blame for that. But uh, um, of course, uh, rapid fire is brought to us by Wellington Breweries, Hellas Lager. Uh, you can check them out at their uh, um, their brewery location in Guelph, Ontario, or pick up some cans wherever you get your, your, your adult beverages. Um, Hellas Lager. Or what is it? Hellas Lager? Hellas, yeah. So uh, thanks again for Wellington. They keep us running throughout the uh, all these years, uh, as well as when we're on the road for conventions, as well as when we're stuck inside uh, during uh, quasi-lockdown or whatever, or just the winter months. Let's not kid ourselves. I'm not going out anywhere in January. It's too cold. Um, anyway, so uh, guys, we're going to wrap things up, but uh, but uh, I'm going to go to a quick commercial. Um, can we? Can you guys hang around for a few more minutes and, yep. and we'll answer a few more questions before we go sure. off here? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, awesome. Uh, everyone stick around. We'll be back with the co-directors of For the Sake of Vicious, Gabriel Carrere and Reese Evaneshin. We'll have some other questions right after this. Black Fawn Distro. Movies, merchandise. Available now at blackfawndistribution.com. 
And that's, of course, our shameless self-promotional plug for Black Fawn Distro. Of course, we've got movies and merchandise in our in our store, uh, blackfawndistribution.com slash store. Check it out if you can. Um, of course, all of our merchandise is created by uh, Twisted Teas. And um, um, big shout out to them. Of course, our, our coffee blend, Appetite for Caffeination, Sweet Toffee of Mine, uh, is available in our store as well. And that was a partnership up with Deadly Grounds Coffee. Uh, so if you're if you need coffee, if you need merch, um, check us out in the store. And of course, guys, uh, I'm 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 still joined by uh, directors Reese Evaneshin and Gabriel Carrere, uh, co-directors of For the Sake of Vicious. Of course, it's streaming on Shutter uh, this Thursday, or starting the stream on Shutter on this Thursday, uh, January sixth. Uh, make sure you check it out. And of course, if you're in Canada, uh, you can grab a Blu-ray copy either through the Raven Banner Store or through Sunrise Records or Cinema One. Uh, check this movie out. It is an insane, wild ride, uh, and I definitely recommend it um, big time. So. Uh, Quick shout out to the music uh, of the show. Uh, we were talking about soundtracks earlier, but uh, the music for tonight's program is provided by the amazing Derek Prince Cox. He did our intro uh, uh, intro theme and created it a few months back, and uh, we're proud to have that open up the show every uh, every couple of weeks. Uh, ben Living from BenLivingMusic.com. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram at Ben Living. Uh, did the beats for our new segment, and he also does a lot of different uh, beats for. Um, he has a lot of remixes and stuff. Definitely worth checking out. He remixes like old school uh, horror themes and that sort of stuff, and with like you know hip hop beats and that sort of stuff. So uh, really, really cool artist. And of course, uh, our commercial music uh, provided by Fox Grinder. Um, thanks again for uh, for for providing that. Um, and uh, hopefully, you guys enjoyed the music tonight as well. Uh, of course, it's always great to support uh, local independent artists. Um, of course, I've thrown up the uh, their their uh, their handles at the bottom here on um, on the on online. So if you're watching on Facebook or Twitch or Twitter or YouTube, give them a follow. Uh, they'd appreciate it. And uh, you know, we uh, we will do what we can to help them out as well. So, okay, guys, thanks again for sticking around. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, we're over you know the one and a half hour mark. Uh, I think this might actually even be the longest podcast we've ever done. I'll have to check. Um, that's not a challenge, but uh, let's see how things go. Um, now, I wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, just influences and um, you know there's we've been friends for years I mean I've hung out with Gabe a ton of times like we've gone to record shops together and all that stuff um, but uh, I mean what was the where do the where do the influences come for like and you can talk specifically about for the sake of vicious or you know or, or just movies in general um, what kind of influences you guys in 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 how does that can you give us an example of the, how it's how it's helped a film that you've worked on Radio silent. <laughs> My game was going to be the first one to jump on it. So go. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Now at this point, like if you asked me 10 years ago, it would have been something else. And then, you know, it's now at this time, it's a cherry picking, like melt, melt, like just this vat of stew of influences. Um, you know, as you get older, and you're making that things, whether whatever you're doing, producing things, you're looking at other artists, not necessarily in the same thing that you're doing. Like, you know, you might be making films, but you're listening, you like a lot of musicians and you kind of like look at what they're doing and see how their careers have progressed with their art. And then it kind of gives you time to reflect on like what you're doing. Um, and, you know, you really got to, it's just a melting pot. Like I, I can't name maybe one because there's just lots so was there anything in spe like specifically that influenced the script for oh for this, this movie, or this script. well just um, yeah I mean I mean you pick pick either or I don't know I mean some people I think say I think the biggest thing like and I I told Reese at the beginning was like the movie Point Break there's an action scene in the film where Keanu Reeves arrives late to his own raid and it's with uh, uh, Anthony uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers guy he's in oh, the house Anthony, and, Anthony Kiedis yeah Anthony Kiedis and that little raid thing that happens in the house was always like, I just loved how dirty and real and it was just rough with the lawnmower machine and they're in the house, that kind of like maddening noise that you hear that to me was always kind of like, I wanted that vibe, you know, in the, in the film somewhere. Really? That, that chaos. Yeah. yeah. Cause that, yeah. that scene as a kid that still strikes out, like, if you watch that scene and compare it to action films today, it's it's nothing. But there's a reason why it's so good. What's what's the sub place in Point Blank? What Point Break? Sorry, what's what's the sub place in Point Break when he's just like Utah, make it too. The meatball sub place doesn't have a name. Do you know that? 
Uh, it's not a, it's not a, they, I, they actually don't know. They actually don't have the name for that place. No. Okay. Okay. What is it? Utah, make it two. Make it two. Utah, give me two. Give me two. <laughs> <laughs> Only Gary Busey could eat two meatballs. So what, a, what a fucking legend. <laughs> um, no, no, that, that's interesting. Cause I remember that scene. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. I'll think about that next time I watch that movie. Um, Reese, uh, anything for you as far as like what influenced, uh, you know, what went into the script or maybe even in, in your direction style for, for this? Yeah. One? I mean, it's, it's trickier with this one because I feel like there were, it, it really does feel like what Gabe said, the melting pot for this one specifically, like as an example, if I look at defective, I go, that's me feeling like Paul Verhoeven, RoboCop, Total Recall, uh, you know, Soylent Green, Planet of the Apes, Ro- uh, Terminator, like the shooting style and the feel of it. Like those, those were very clear to me. With this one, it was more so just um, in the moment, I couldn't really think of anything specific that we were referencing because uh, it just felt like such a weird hodgepodge of ideas, the script. Um, you know, cause it's like a home invasion movie, but it's kind of not, and it flips its head. Um, but I know we would constantly talk about different filmmakers, so I can't point to anybody specific. It, it isn't until afterwards when you watch the movie where you go, oh, it's got little moments of this or little moments of that. And I mean, some of the obvious references that we've seen reviews point out are, are totally accurate. Like Nicholas Wine and Refn, for sure. Uh, we were watching, what was his Amazon series? Yeah, Ray, too, uh, too Old to Die Young. Too Old to Die Young. We were watching that yeah, as we were watch that. Yeah, as we were planning the shots and stuff. So I know that was a big influence. I mean, um, but I know when we were shooting, like we at no point did I think we ever picked any specific filmmaker. I mean, it was such a crazy, hectic shoot that at a certain point we were just both of us at different times were pulling shots out of our ass. So like, yeah. and at that point as a filmmaker got you've Lord knows you've seen it in something else. So um, I kind of leaned on Fillmore because part of the reason I wanted to work with him is I loved his visual style for his movies. And that's the sort of thing I, I struggle with is more the visual style of things. And I, I thought it'd be kind of fun to, to learn from him and see how he, he kind of figures it out. So you know, I used the demolishers as my influence. There we go. How did we shoot that? Let's just do that. Um, well, I'll never forget with Alistair on set with the lighting, I wanted more red in the kitchen. And I know yeah. we were fighting with the camera crew. And then I think the next day, Alistair, he watched, he found a copy of it and he watched the movie twice and made notes. And then from there on, it was kind of, he just, Alistair knew, didn't even have to talk to him. He just did yeah. his own thing with it. It, it's hard to explain to people the kind of unmotivated light. Like it's just, yeah. you know, like I like to use uh, Dario Argento Suspiria or some of his movies as an example where you have these insane light sources that don't make any sense whatsoever, but nobody questions it. Cause you're just like, well, it looks cool. Yeah. And we have a lot of that. And for the sake of vicious, like there's red and blue lights in the house that you're like, where would that be coming from? It doesn't yep. make any sense, but it doesn't matter. Um, and the general audience who watches it just goes, you just, you're just kind of there along for the ride. It's like, it, who cares where it comes from? It's just, it's, it's yeah. a little, the, the guy, the guy who realized that that table was out of place. That's yes. the guy that, that realizes it. Yes. Yes. The one who's Those like, letters aren't on the floor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think Blood Simple is another one too with, uh, Coen brothers. Yeah. 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 Blood Simple, that movie, you watch the lightning in that. And that movie's, like, aw- that movie's awesome. It's, that movie's it's, it's incredible. You know, oh, and I know there was yeah. more movies shot to look like that. That'd be yeah. Fantastic. I know another big influence, and this is an obvious one because he's amazing, was Jeremy Sonye with Blue Ruin, yeah. Green Room. Um, like that guy's like just his style and his his feel and his tone. I mean, obviously you can't replicate that because that's what he does. But even just to get like kind of in that same sort of mind space of that sort of I mean, there's just, like Blue Ruin and Green Room are so nihilistic and grim and not even just the violence, like tone wise, you just feel dirty after watching it, yeah. you know? Green, Green, like, Room, Green Room was one of my favorite movies that I yeah. watched that year when it came out. And, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just from my experience being, uh, you know, I've gone on a few tours, I've been in that same situation. And I remember watching that and my heart rate was up when they yeah. go because I knew, I knew what the movie was, right. Yes. Like, you know, you know, read the synopsis. You, you have an idea. I wasn't going in completely blind and I'd seen the trailer, but when they were going to the place, 
I was like, oh my God. I go, this is how it happens. Like that's so, it's so spot on with like a show bailed. We've got a guy that promote the promoter can't pay us, but his cousin knows a place that we can go and play a show for like 300 bucks or whatever. And we can put money in the gas tank or whatever. And I was like, no, don't go there. And like, <laughs> and I also felt um the guy who plays Worm, who is like the 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 main kind of I guess he's not the main villain, that's obviously Patrick Stewart, but the guy in the metal band that's in yeah. the green room. Yeah. Is I thought that was he's one of the best villains on screen in the last yeah. like 10 years. Like just yeah just so like there's a lot of guys in metal that are like, you know, I had, a, I, I knew a guy once that told me that um, he's like, there's a lot of guys in metal that, that's, that sing about like Satan and death and all these like scary things. He's like, and they'll watch a scary movie and sleep with a light on. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I've always remembered that. And I just always remember that movie, especially being like, yeah, but there's also, there's also some, you know, there's bad people everywhere, right? Yeah. In, in, in every art form and whatever, and every Absolutely. every occupation. Yeah. And uh, I just thought that movie just hit the nail on the head with that. Like I was just, I was just such a such a visceral experience, right? So that, that's cool to hear that. I was kind of an influence. Yeah, hundred percent. Awesome. Um, speaking of influences, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up as well. Um, but I had a quick question, uh, Gabe. Um, I I know that uh, uh, you know you, you'd sent me. Uh, um, a list of, of, of uh, or sorry, um, just a bunch of photos as well. And I didn't actually get to use this one today, but I wanted to talk to you quickly about what it was working, what, what it was like working with Henry Rollins. And uh, you worked with him in one of your past features in the house of flies, which is actually um, hitting Tubi uh, in, I think uh, in, in the new year. Um, nice. uh, we're looking, I think, yeah, I think right now uh, it's probably about March or April, but it should be on, on Tubi. And if you're not sure what Tubi is and you're listening and you're in Canada, go to, go find Tubi. It's uh, basically free Netflix. They've got a massive catalog of films up there, including, I think over 5,000 horror films. Uh, so make sure you check them out. It's free. You just have to, there's, there's ads and whatever, mm -hmm. but it's massive in the States. Not too many people know about it up here in Canada, but if you go there, you can actually check out if, if a tree falls, which is, uh, one of the first projects that Reese and Gabe, uh, our guest tonight worked on, uh, you can check that out for free. It's on Tubi. Uh, so check it out. I think it's Tubi.tv, uh, and set up an account and it's free to watch. So, uh, but anyway, getting back to this, uh, Gabe, can you, I, I got a photo here cause I got to throw it up, man. Cause it's such a fucking cool photo. And, uh, I wanted to give it some time in the sun just because it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's such a badass photo, but, um, can you talk to us about, um, let's see, let's throw it up here. Yeah. I mean, like, look at these, look at these guys, like, that was Isn't when that... I was eating salad. <laughs> <laughs> um, salad days. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit about that experience about about working with because he's I mean that guy's a uh, he's a legend, right? Yeah, man, he was so dude. Like it still pipes me that like it doesn't even feel like he was like I feel like I look at that photo I'm like I don't even remember it, but. um it's amazing when you meet, I don't want to say your heroes or your role models or inspirations or whatever, but you're just meeting someone who like, you know, um, as Henry Rollins is to thousands and millions of other people that you look up to, you know, at the music and art and just the way, he, you know, and I remember uh, I went to a few of his live shows and at the end of one, I was like, Angus had the script. I was like, okay, I'm going to go back and tour bus and see if I can stalk him. And I remember meeting him out, meeting him outside. There was like only five people outside behind the venue. That's it. And it was just him standing there. I was like, this is fucking Henry Rollins. Like, why isn't it like more people? Finally, he's like very direct. Like he is, he like that's the thing with him, right? He's like he doesn't put on an act. Like how he is, is how he is. So like when it came my turn, it's like, hey man, he's like, hello. I'm like, hi Henry. He'll shake his hand. It's exactly what that is. I'm like. I'm like, I'm just wondering how I can contact you. I, I have a script my friend wrote. We're making an independent film. And, you know, I want to give it, see if, you know, I don't know what I said. He's like, just email me, Ned. I'm like, what's your email? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it's on my website. I'm like, you get that? That's your email? He goes, yeah, that's my email. I that's So, like, to email his website is a legitimate email. I'm like, okay. So I went home that night, sent him an email. He got back to me like two days later um, and then his, uh, I think Heidi May got involved and I sent her the script and she's like, yeah, Henry likes it, blah, blah, blah. And I am, then his agent got on board and then we, long story short, we flew down for two days and uh, I remember being nervous, like, to, like just balls to the wall, nervous because like, number one, you're not at some shitty 
underground recording studio in LA. You're at the LA Margarita Mix. Well, and, number number one, it's Henry fucking Rollins. <laughs> right? So I remember like, it has like a fountain. It seemed like, it felt like a spa in there. And I remember going in, like we were like t- half an hour early. Like we were early. And I remember going up to the desk lady and she's like, I'm like, oh, we're here. Oh, so she's like, oh yeah. She goes, Henry's here. He's at the back of the hall. The last door on your right, you can go down. I'm like, oh, he's here? And like, I remember turning around to Chad and Angus. I'm like, dude, he's like, here, we got to go back. They're like, okay, man, let's go. So I'm like, I remember walking down the hall, this hallway, and there's this door, and it's like half open. And I'm like, this is the door. This is the door that Henry Rollins is in. We're going to like work with him. <laughs> and I remember before yeah. entering, I remember seeing the, the crack because the door is just open a little bit. And he was sitting there, and I could see him through the crack sitting there. And he's on his laptop, and he's drinking a fucking Diet Coke. And the thing that's going through my head is, he drinks Diet Coke. <laughs> like, I, I drink, I drink like, Diet Coke. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's so weird. Like, he drinks Diet Coke. And you're thinking, like, oh, that's, you know, like, okay, he drinks Diet Coke. And I remember knocking. He's like, yeah, yeah, come in. And I remember we entered, and we sat at this table, and he talks. Like, you can't even get a word in. Like, we sat down, bing, bada, boom, starts, we start talking about, you know, simple stuff, LA, whatever, you know, and then uh, we started talking about movies. He's a huge movie buff. Um, started talking about like heat. Um, and then we went in the studio oh, yeah. and it was pretty, it was pretty easy. Like it's when you go in the studio with Henry Rollins and he had the script and he has the audio guy there, you kind of just let him do his thing. Um, right. And say it because that's what you're there for. He's the professional. He's been doing this double, triple times us. So, um, there was a few things with lines like he would ask, he would ask once in a while, like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, do it. He he already knew what to do. Like he knew I'm going to do this next one slower. I'm going to do this next one like this. I'm going to do this. You didn't have to tell him. Right. Right. And most people at that level are so professional that they just automatically do it. You're there just to kind of supervise, get what you can get and then leave. Um, so that was, that was, that was the, that was really interesting. I remember they came in with salsa and chips. And uh, I remember just like eating chips and salsa with like Henry Rollins as we were talking like about music and movies. And it was just like <laughs> fucking California. Eh? It was just, <laughs> it was just uh, yeah, but that's, that's a thing when you're, when you're, yeah. And then, then that was, that was it. It's uh, yeah, it was awesome. Well, you know what? I'm going to throw this photo up. One There's a behind time. the scenes video on the uh, YouTube with it actually. Of us in the studio. I think it's on there. Yeah, and uh and it was on the DVD. I know that. Yeah. Um, so if anyone had the in the House of Flies DVD, it's uh, the, the the special features have that that uh yeah, that trip down to LA when you when you went down Matt Rollins. So uh, I'm just gonna throw this photo up on the on the screen one more time. Look look at these guys. I mean, I think it's a challenge to our audience out there. If you want if you need to get Gabe a gift or want to give him a gift, just get him this photo on a t shirt. <laughs> It'd be fantastic and then or get him two and then he'll give one to he'll give one to henry next time you see him right gabe <laughs> oh, he doesn't remember me <laughs> um uh listen i, I think uh, a great place to leave it uh guys um thanks so much for t- for taking the t- taking the time tonight uh i know it's a, a lot to ask um but uh listen um before we go um what can you tell us about uh you're obviously on this press tour um you're promoting uh for the sake of vicious dropping on shutter this thursday uh, January 6th and uh, of course available on uh, through Raven Banner Entertainment as well. Um, check out their website at Raven Banner. Uh, is it Raven Banner? I think it's ravenbanner.com. Uh, I don't have it in front of me here, but, uh, or I'm going to pick up a copy of For the Sake of Vicious on Blu-ray at Sunrise or Cinema One or, uh, or and you can get it on Amazon, I believe too, right guys? Yep. Okay, perfect. And iTunes, you can rent it. Yeah. Yeah, rent it digitally iTunes. Um, yep. Yeah, it, and it's on VOD as well. So, yep. um, uh, but speaking, any plans for anything coming up next or, uh, um, you know, where are you guys, uh, where are you guys sitting with uh, with future projects after, uh, after you kind of get done the tour with this one? Nothing. I just expected to go first. <laughs> yeah, I want to go first. I should throw it. Sorry, sorry. That's my fault. That's my 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 fault. You want you want to lead with that, Gabe? Tell us what you got coming up next. Um, it's just development time. You know, you're, you're coming up with ideas. You're trying to write scripts. It's that that time after every movie ends. You know, you go back to the drawing, especially you know when you're independent. You're. It's not like someone's going to like. Hey, do you want to go direct this movie now? Like, 
at least for me, it's not. So it's like, you know, <laughs> you're back to square one again, essentially. So there's a few ideas that, you know, varying degrees of budgets, you know, you got the, the movie that you can go make with your fucking iPhone next week. You know what I mean? And then you got your other right. movie and then the other movie. So it's just like, I have those. So now it's just a matter of like developing them a little bit more and then seeing what bites. And uh, can, can people, like, how can people get in touch if they want to reach out just uh, through your Instagram is fine. Yeah. Instagram. Okay. Perfect. And Reese, what about yourself? You got anything on the, uh, on the back burner that's getting moved up to the front of the stove? Um, well, I mean, first off, just, I want to go back to the commercial that you played right before we started. You pointed out the fantastic artwork on the Blu-ray and I wanted to give a quick shout out to the artist. Cause yeah. she's, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's SG posters. Um, and her, I be, I'm going to mispronounce her name is Eileen Steinbach. Uh, so you can find her on Instagram at SG, SG underscore posters. Uh, she did this for us. She does a ton of posters for a bunch of films, I guess 2020 was more than one of her most successful years. And we were just so happened to be lucky that they commissioned her to do kind of a, uh, a special edition criterion esque cover for us. And she was, she was amazing to work with because she did a first round then we had a great meeting with her where Gabe and I kind of pitched our ideas and what we thought the movie was about. And she came back at us with those and we we're like, Holy crap. Like this, yeah. this, she's phenomenal. So Eileen Steinbach, SG posters, Look her up on Instagram and Twitter. She's incredible. Um, and she supports a bunch of indie local artists. And she loves working on all different kinds of movies, budgets, low budget, mid budget. It's it's all there. So uh, Yeah, her Instagram is pretty amazing. Like you can get kind of lost in her visuals on it. Yeah, and this is a fantastic, uh, just a, just for our viewers at home, just a fantastic uh, piece of art here on the front. Did she do the uh, the other? Did she do this artwork as well, or was it just the just the slipcase? Just the slipcase. Just the yeah. slipcase. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I just feel that this makes like this is why physical media is so awesome. Uh, I think these were limited edition as well, so you can only get yeah. them. Uh, I was fortunate enough to grab this uh, from the Raven Banner booth at um, uh, Frightmare in the Falls. Uh, shout out to Sean. Uh, thanks, buddy. And uh, I know how much uh, time and effort he puts into kind of. Um, you know, corralling all that stuff together as well. Absolutely. So uh, yep. it's a, it's a really, really sweet package. And, and definitely if you can find that one um, uh, definitely pick it up because it's uh yeah, it's a, it's a good price point and it's um it's definitely worth having in your collection for sure. And lots of deleted. Let's see, we got uh director commentary, cast commentary, deleted scenes with commentary, and then uh, some behind the scenes. And uh, I think it looks like some special effects featurettes on here as well. So yeah. for the sake of vicious uh, out now in Canada on Raven banner, uh, make sure you pick up that physical copy. If that's your bag or uh, rent it on VOD, or digital or wherever you uh, rent your movies. And of course, if you're in the States and Reese, you said um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the UK as well uh, yep. for yep. shutter this Tuesday or this Thursday, uh, January yep. 6th, correct? Yep. Absolutely. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, okay. Well, thanks a lot guys. Um, uh, really, really do appreciate you making the time. Uh, we've eclipsed the two hour mark. I don't think anyone else has done that. I don't, even <laughs> think, I don't even think Chad did that. So we'll have to take a look. I'll let you guys know. Uh, but thanks so much for, uh, um, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for, for jumping on and doing this. We really do appreciate it. Um, please stick around, uh, after we go off the air. Okay. I just want to, I want to ask you guys a couple more other questions. Um, once we, uh, once we stop going live here. Um, uh, but, uh, again, to, uh, just make sure you follow Gabe and Reese on Instagram at Gabe career or, and, uh, at uh, Revanation, I guess that's how you would say it. Um, that's their handles. Um, we've been posting on our our. Never even noticed that, Reese. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Not bad, eh? Yeah. Take that, take that, Henry Rollins photo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's throw it up one more time. There we yeah, go. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and of course, uh, make sure you check out these guys' previous work as well. So check out For the Sake of Vicious, it's an awesome film. Uh, but also make sure you go and check out uh, Defective, uh, as well as The Demo the Demolisher, uh, as well as In the House of Flies, and If a Tree Falls, which is available on uh, on Tubi uh, as well for free. So um, thanks everyone else for uh, for tuning in. We really do appreciate it. Um, I'm your host, Benner, from Black Fawn Distro. And uh, we do, um, if you are tuning on tuning in live, we I just want to say thank you, everyone, for their support over the last year. A happy new year to everyone out there. And uh, thank you as well for all of your questions tonight. Um, guys, anything to add before we go? No, I just, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to help us out here and support us. And, uh, you know, we've known each other a long time, all of us. And it's, uh, it's just cool that we're all still going in some form or another, even during this, this craziness. And it's, uh, it's just great to kind of feel the love and have the support. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, hey, dude, nope. this, this was super awesome. Yeah, for sure. Okay. 
No problem, guys. Well, um, you know, the purpose of this show was just to kind of, you know, talk to people that were in the film industry and kind of share stories about filmmaking and passing that on to other filmmakers and, you know, just having a good time while doing it. So uh, I'm happy that you guys were on the show and, and it was awesome to catch up with you. And hey, I learned some stuff as well. And uh, yeah, for sure. So uh, anyway, to all of our other, uh, um, uh, all of our viewers out there, um, thanks again for tuning in. Please remember to follow us, like, follow, like, share, and subscribe, and check us out on Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, we do broadcast every two weeks uh, on live on those platforms, and then we retransmit uh, through all the major podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts, or wherever you pick up your favorite podcasts. So um, make sure you check us out on there, and uh, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you in a couple of weeks with our next guest on Black Fun Distro's Takeover Tuesday. Take care. And that does it for another episode of Black Fawn Distro's Takeover Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, please remember to like, follow, share, and subscribe, and help us spread the word about the program and our incredible guests. If you're interested in grabbing some more information about Black Fawn Distribution or want to check out our film titles and merchandise, you can find us online at blackfawndistribution.com. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, Wellington Breweries, Hellas Lager, Deadly Grounds Coffee, Twisted Teas, and of course, Black Fawn Distribution. Just a reminder, you can always catch Black Fawn Distro's Takeover Tuesday live on Facebook, YouTube, and our other social media platforms. Or pick up one of our retransmissions on any of the major streaming platforms. Until next time, I'm your host, Benner, from Black Fawn Distro, and we'll see you soon.